There's a couple of people who are joining in, but let's let's get started. Um, my name is Varun Malik. I'm the CEO of a new age consulting firm called Consolidon. Uh, Consolidon is new age in the sense that we haven't taken the traditional consulting uh, firm approach, uh, which is, you know, they hire a lot of consultants and then staff them on projects as the need arises. Uh, our approach was different in that we uh, partnered with a lot of boutique consulting firms. So we partner with over 300 boutique consulting firms um, and uh, our managing partners uh, bring projects to the ecosystem. And from the ecosystem, these projects go to the boutique firms that deliver the projects. Um, so uh, what we did uh, earlier this year is decided that we're uh, together with about 70 of the boutique firms in our ecosystem, we're going to do a web summit uh, where we have about uh, 50 plus panel discussions and uh, webinars over a seven day period. We also have these six workshops in the evening, 5 to 8 p.m. every day. Uh, today is the second workshop, which is being led by uh, Piers uh, and Jonathan and Richard. Uh, the first time I heard about quality of mind, I thought, uh, I mean, I think uh, it's the phrase itself, uh, uh, you know, really, really intrigued me. And then when I started hearing more about it from some of Piers, uh, videos and talks, which I think some of you might have already heard of. I was very, very intrigued to find out more. So I know a little bit about it, but I'm really, really looking forward to hear more today. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Piers uh, to take it from here. Uh, looking forward, Piers. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Varun, very much for the introduction. So um, welcome to this uh, workshop. Um, it's great you can all be here. So. Um, First of all, I'm just going to share my screen so I can show you a little bit about uh, some of the things I'm going to be talking about. Um, hopefully everyone can see that. If you were able to come on your videos, it would be really nice to see you so we can engage uh, properly. So if you have a chance to come on your video, please do, because it's nicer to talk to humans than black spaces on the, on the screen. So um, today is going to be all about um, quality of mind. Um, but probably just worth giving just a little overview about uh, me and making change work just for a minute. So um, in, a, in a small nutshell, um, I'm from the UK. Um, I've been in the coaching, personal development, um, professional development, innovation arena for 20 odd years. Um, the first 10 years of my career, I was very into things like positive psychology, NLP, lots of tools and techniques. Um, I've worked with lots of organizations, big ones, small ones, all around the world. Um, but the most interesting thing I think for me is what happened for me about 10 years ago um, when I came across a different way of seeing the mind. And that was the embryo, the start point of quality of mind, which is a pioneering, quite a game-changing potentially approach to um, shifting how we see the mind and therefore helping things around change and transformation, unlocking all sorts of hidden levels of resourcefulness, which we're gonna get into today. Um, and that's what my passion has been for the last sort of 10, 15 years. Um, and that's what I'm gonna share a little bit with you uh, about today to see whether you can get curious as well. Um, so Quality of Mind is part of uh, Making Change Work Group. Um, we're part of the ecosystem that Varun just mentioned. Um, the parent company is called Making Change Work. Um, we've also got other businesses that do similar things of brand change in travel. We also do some change management resourcing, and uh, we also have an office in uh, UAE with Varan and in Saudi Arabia as well. So it's part of the change. Yeah. Uh, so there's a short sort of screen, uh, or you know, the uh, your screen sharing. Uh, can you just hide that somehow? Yes, yeah, sorry. Maybe um, if you just look outside or... There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. So, um, it'd be really helpful to try and get the best out of this three hours and the best out of this virtual experience and the best benefit for you. Um, if we could, I, I don't want to teach you to suck eggs on this, but there's a few things that would really help. Um, I'm going to try and make this a little bit interactive. Um, if so, if we, I'm going to ask you some questions sometimes, and if you can respond in the chat, 
um, that'd be very helpful. Um, or raise your hand or maybe some direct speaking, depending. Um, try to keep the external distractions down to a minimum, especially when you get bored. I'm hoping you won't get bored, but um, <laughs> if you do, <laughs> try to keep them out of the way. Um, contribute and um, whenever you can, but be, be relevant and succinct because there's a few people on here and we haven't got long. So try and be relevant and succinct when you contribute. Um, and join the space, right? So what I mean by that is you don't have to always be contributing, but it might be that just by being in the space with us, um, it helps us feel more engaged. Um, if you can use your cameras, that'd be really helpful. Um, and if you can have them well positioned as well, so you can look into them, that would also be helpful. And you never know, we might even experience some virtual intimacy. Uh, we've all got quite good at that recently. So um, just be in this space together and see what occurs from that. What's really important as we get into the understanding behind quality of mind is that you are able to um, listen fresh. And what we mean by listen fresh is listen to what we're going to be talking about with just a beautiful curiosity rather than trying to compare it to what you've already. So as human beings, we're quite good to listening to things and then thinking, oh, yes, I know what that is, or that's like that. If you can try and listen fresh, explore as if you don't know, it will really help. So imagine you're like seven or eight years old. You know, little kiddies can listen beautifully without any preconception. You'll get more out of this. So I hope that helps a little bit on that. So um, what we would like to know um, is why did you sign up to this seminar? So I've heard from a couple of people, but can you put something in the chat about what brought you here and what you're hoping to get out of it? Because it'd be useful for us to um, measure what we can we can talk about a little bit. So just put, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Just pop up a couple of words in the chat. I hope you all know how to use the chat down the bottom little bubble. Um, but what brought you here? What is it you want to get from this? Okay, they're coming through. Great. So just have a look and see what your um, colleagues are saying, your fellow delegates. Do more for less, psychology graduate. Okay, intrigue. Okay. Great. Keep them coming, the comments if you like. Okay. Well, I think if whatever, whatever brought you here, if you can have some intrigue and curiosity, that's probably all you'll need because you'll find the relevance of this for you because it's, it'd be quite individual for you. So, um, you know, even if you want different things, if you have a curiosity and intrigue, that will really help. Okay. That's really helpful. So even the title is doing a good job, but that's nice to know that quality of mind. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about um, over these next three hours today, um, we're going to talk about what's the one thing that really makes change work pervasively and transformatively. What is quality of mind, this thing we're calling quality of mind, and what's its role and relevance for your life and work and being future fit? We're going to talk about the mind and we're going to use a couple of metaphors to help us do that um, just to help us understand and explore a new way um, we're going to touch on and explore hopefully briefly uh, how quality of mind enables all the benefits that we talk about and, and an alternative view on actually how the mind itself works and then a little bit of well so what now what and hopefully what you'll leave with in three hours time um, is what I would describe as some ahas, some little light bulbs, some, oh, yes, I hadn't thought of that. Or something that gets you curious to carry on reflecting about something that could be a really important game changer for everything, actually. So, it may not be that you get all the answers you want right now in these three hours, but if you can leave with curiosity, it might be in a day's time or a week's time, 
you're going about your day and something occurs to you about what we've said. So staying curious afterwards is really important. You might also leave with a bit of feeling of clarity or peace of mind about something that's important to you. Um, just a feeling of huh, freedom, a bit of potential. Um, and it might be specific to you on something that we, we talk about or something might be very general. As I said, the important thing is that you carry on the curiosity after this. In, in a way, there's a lot to get out of these three hours, but also there's a lot that you can take and reflect on afterwards and we'll send you some more resources if you're interested but staying curious will be absolutely key so we are going to talk about being future fit and how we can be more future fit for our work and life but but, but the way we're going to do that is by giving you uh, an opportunity to update the firmware on on the system so you can take the metaphor you know if you want your computer to run faster or download new software you've got to update the firmware so we're going to be focusing on updating the firmware on or the operating system on your computer so that you can see things in a better way for the future now a little exercise that we can all do to start with okay so would it be great if you can just if you've got something to write down or, or maybe just remember this, um, think of something in your life or work and you don't need to particularly share these so it can be anything for you. Think of something right now that you would love fresh thought and perspective on. So it might be something going on at work, it might be something in your uh, life at home, anything that you would like fresh thinking, fresh perspective, to see a new way, to have a new level of resourcefulness. And then jot that down, write that down on a piece of paper if you can, and then put it to one side. So just spend a minute to think about that in your own minds. Again, these can be personal, you're not gonna to have to necessarily share these, so you can write, you can write down something real and genuine. You can write down more than one thing if you want. <laughs> and can I ask anyone else, if they want to come on the cameras, please do. It'd be nice to see more of you. I'm not seeing a huge many of you at the moment. So at the moment, we're just writing down something, a just a couple of sentences on something you would like to have fresh perspective or thinking about. And once you've done that, leave it to one side. It might be, I can't decide, you know, my career, which opportunity to take. It might be, you've got a problem dealing with someone at work. It might be, you need to decide where to invest in something. It doesn't matter what it is. It might be something to do with your children, if you have kids. I don't know how I can get that thing off my screen. I'll try, but it seems to keep popping up. Apologies for that. So has everyone had a chance to do that? I can see a few nodding faces, so I'm going to take you as democratic for everyone else. <laughs> so keep that to the side. We'll come back to that later on. Okay. So we won't forget it, but we're not going to look at it for the moment. So quality of mind, uh, we describe as a hidden variable and we describe it as something that is making a huge difference to all of us all of the time but we're not always aware of it and once we start to notice it it can be a huge foundation for exponential potential and sustainable growth in any aspect for any person now that's quite a claim. I do get that. It's quite a big claim. So hopefully you're going to get a chance to uh, point to why that claim is, gen is genuine and justified. So what um, is it? Well, Ailes, we... You can ignore those uh, pop-ups. I'll, I'll take care of them. Okay. Sorry about just, that. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know why it's coming up on this screen, not my other screen. I've got two monitors here. It seems to come up on the screen that... Um, you're presenting Chrome, see. unfortunately, yeah. So what is this thing, quality of mind? So it's an underlying variable, but what to? So if you think about it for you or for anyone, 
think about in the moment our access to some certain attributes so our ability to be agile and adaptable so to to roll with changes and to be flexible our ability to get to clarity and what we call obviousness where you just know what to do to have fresh idea a bit of creativity something new comes into your mind a new solution a fresh thought um, to see something that you didn't see before uh, a new possibility a new perspective an ability to be resilient to bounce forward feel confident not be knocked over for too long by something that doesn't go your way to feel an innate in a sense of okayness, content, peace of mind, well-being, mental health. To feel inspired. So, you know, sometimes you can just do something and it just sort of comes with the wind behind you and you're like, yeah, I'm going to do that. It doesn't require a lot of effort. I mean, it requires some doing, but not effort. Inspiration. The ability to understand someone else just by being there and listening and really getting on the same page and intuitively understanding and connecting. A sense of connection to what you're doing, your tasks, your, your goals, your purpose, and even your life. All of these things you could describe as being more in the flow or in the zone. In, in sport, they often call it being in the zone. In music and art, they often call it being in flow. We sort of have a name in business, having a good day, right? Now, all of those things are available to us, but it's probably fair to say that as a human being, they go up and down, they fluctuate, they vary. And in some moments it can look like, wow, I don't have any of this. You know, life's really hard, work's going on. I'm having to, it's like walking through mud, through treacle and things are difficult and it looks like the world's coming at you. And some other times it can feel like we can get a lot done. We're very in the flow. We've got a lot of productivity. We know what to do. We know what to say. We get a lot done in not much time. So we're pointing to the fact that all of these things are there, but they go up and down. They vary from low to high in different moments. We've all probably experienced low, we've all probably experienced high. Sometimes it can change from nine o'clock in the morning till 9.30. Sometimes it can change in a week or, or, a, or a month in the minute. So it completely varies, but it goes up and down. Now, if you're thinking about this when it comes to organizations and change um, and that kind of thing, how does quality of mind help us when we're working with other people um, get things done? Well. If you think about a group or a team or a, a, a tribe or a, a government even, there's different levels that the quality of mind will play out at. At the very bottom, if people are really in a low quality of mind, you'll get people sabotaging each other. Everyone's own agenda is coming out. It's not about self-preservation, right? You often see that in political setups. <laughs> We've probably had that a fair share over here with Brexit and everything going on. It's been, you know, it's, that, that happens, right? And if you're unlucky, that's happening in an organization too. One level up from that, you get people who are uh, sort of, they're still quite close in their quality of mind and they might say the right thing, but they're not really owning it. They don't really mean it. It's kind of lip service or they're shirking responsibility or they're still very attached to what they think. So they're a little bit close and withdrawn. They're not overtly sabotaging, but a little bit close and withdrawn. One level up from that, this is where you get a lot of where a lot of organizations have their conversations. It's quite transactional. So the, the communication and the change is kind of, it's quite linear. It's not very reflective or systemic. Um, people are thinking from their own minds and then convincing others or influencing others about how great their ideas are. People are quite blind to their assumptions that they're making. Um, going into the unknown feels uncomfortable. So they don't tend to go, they're quite risk averse. And people are comparing what they think with everyone else thinks to see who's right and wrong. Now, if you go into a higher quality of mind, you get a team or a group or a, or a collection of people in what we would call emergent dialogue. And that's where fresh creativity, perspective, alignment emerges, non-linear often. And something comes out of the room and everyone's like, yes, that's it. Because 
when you get that, that's where things move forward in a, in a non-linear way. That's where you get changes and that's where you get new creativity, possibility, building of new understanding. The known isn't even, doesn't even need to be that predictable because the known is temporary. Now, if, we're more, if we spend more of our time in a, as a team or an organization in emergent dialogue, we'll be more fit for the future. So this is just an illustration of how quality of mind would affect change. I'm hoping this is making some sense. Please do ask questions in the chat um, if, if what we're saying doesn't make sense and either myself or Jonathan will come back. So um, if, if I'm saying something, put your hand up or put in the chat and I can then reiterate something to you. So what we're saying is just to, so for the individual, this is what's available from quality of mind. And when it gets into teams and organizations, you can have some more of this, plus a bunch of individuals that are having more of what was on the previous, which would in itself would make a huge difference. So how do we have more of this? How do we have more of this? How do we have a higher quality of mind? Well, you may have heard a phrase a bit like this. If you want to change the visible, if you want to change what people are doing in behavior or what they're creating, you've got to change the invisible. If you just try and change the visible, it's hard work because you're doing change outside in. So what we look at with quality of mind before we get to changing the visible is the invisible, which has one problem, it's invisible. <laughs> But that's also to our advantage. <laughs> so let's start with another question. If you think about it for you now, just reflect for you, okay, and think. When change occurs for you or a, or a group, doesn't really matter, when something shifts, what's the one thing that needs to happen for a change or a development or a transformation to occur? If you think about it in your own scenarios, in your own lives, what is it when you've experienced a big shift? What is it that seems to make the difference? Now, please put something in the chat if you've got an answer on this. Uh, again, no right or wrong. You can write anything you like. But what do you think needs to happen for sustainable change to happen? OK, so thank you, Mohammed. We've got there yours. So we've got uh, treat the issue, not the symptoms a desire to want to change, uh, maybe learning from mistakes, a decision. Okay, so what happens, what needs to happen before a decision? Because a decision is kind of an output. So what do you think determines your decision? What even determines your desire? So go, go right to the sort of the source of this. What do you think needs to be there? Okay, and what needs to happen for a mindset change to happen? Ah, okay, so first thought needs to change. Yeah. Realization, internal desire, yes. Need to reflect, self reflection, thought determines, planning and action. Getting lots of messages here. Willingness, self-realization, knowledge, realization, realization. Is there a lot of people called Hadi? Yeah, okay. Or well, he's just writing a lot. Um, insight, self-belief. It's always better to see the bigger picture. Sorry? Oh, not sure whether that's for me or not. Okay, self-awareness, self -awareness. Okay, thank you for that. Now, what we'd like to point to that the one thing that will need to be there for any change to occur you have sort of been pointing to it with your messages but we're going to, going to get super clear to what this is right and, and then you'll find that lots of the things are the symptoms the results of this is what we would describe as realization now let's take two com very common examples of people trying to learn or change people giving up smoking i don't know if any of you have done that but they've done studies where you know th th they can educate people on the on who want to stop smoking on how bad smoking is for you with all the information about how bad it is how expensive it is how bad it is for your health etc cetera, etc cetera. and about two percent of people will change 98 percent of people don't change 
from knowing it's bad for them and knowing they want to. So we know it's not knowledge, right? We know it's not knowledge. Something has to happen in what we would call behind the eye. Think about it when you're um, maybe teaching a little um, child to ride a bike, to, to understand how a bicycle works and balance. You don't explain it to them. You know, you don't explain motion and gravity and balance. <laughs> they have a realization that it works. And the rest of how they actually hold the handles and do everything else comes from that. So we're saying that realization is the precursor to change. And we describe realization as one set of thoughts, one mindset dissolving and a new one occurring. And if you have realization based change, the change symptomatically happens by itself. It self perpetuates. It comes with its own energy and obviousness and clarity. And it meant, tends to be much more sustainable. So realization is a precursor to change. Otherwise, you're just doing behavior compliance where you might have to use, you know, sort of uh, methods to get people to change behavior compliance through um, carrot or stick, you know, rewarding them if they change or punishing them if they don't change. You can get change like that through compliance. But if you want change to really happen, then it needs to be realization. Nicolette, have you got a, a question there to see your hand up? Yes, sorry. I, I hope you don't mind if I if I jump in and ask a question. Mm. So I completely agree with you. Realization is is very important, but you can realize something and make a great start and do what you think you need to do. But it's as if that realization tapers off and disappears, and and that's the problem. Because it's great to realize something. You might realize. Let's you keep the smoking example. Smoking is bad for you. It can kill you. And then you stop smoking for six months. And then slowly, maybe you have one cigarette when you're out with your friends. And you no, know, so you go back into that bad behavior. How do you keep that realization in the top of your mind to keep you motivated? Maybe I'm jumping the gun, but that's yeah. It's that's um, we hopefully you'll get clear on the answer to that question by the end of these three hours. <laughs> um, but but <laughs> the very you. short answer is. It depends on the nature of the realization you had to start with. And then it's about being always fertile to realization because we don't, you know, the human capacity is we can have abundant realizations. So it might be that realization gets you so far and then you have another one. Right. But we don't want to close our minds down once we've had our realization because that realization will be very limited. It's like sat navs, you know, sat navs, GPS, they automatically update with a new direction. Yeah, but we've got to keep them on. You've got to keep connected. <laughs> so we'll come to that. Okay. Thank you. So, um, how many? Uh, Pierre, sorry, can I just? Uh, okay, can I just say my talk about uh, quickly about my experience with the realization with the realization? If it's quite quick, Basil. Yeah, yeah quick, very quick. Yeah. So I would, uh, as uh, Nicolette said, always realize things, but possibly in the past I didn't take them. Uh, I didn't have discipline in uh, following through with them with it, but I realized that um, it has a lot to do with what within within my heart. So when my heart is completely open, I feel that I have uh, emotional contact with this realization. So it always comes to me as alive, you know. But when my heart is uh, closed and my mind is shut, I I just go uh, move. Uh, uh, move ahead and uh, I don't remember remember it afterwards well I think we will come we will what you're saying I think will be relevant for later very because I think your point this is from my personal experience I didn't yeah. read any book by the way <laughs> yes so that makes sense so um the question that comes to mind is the realization about what someone put in the chat we mean a realization about the thing so a realization about the thing that, that needs to change it comes through with its own intelligence. So it's a realization about the thing. That's what we mean. Realization, sorry, Piers. Realization about the impact of that thing, if it doesn't change, or the impact in case it does change. It, it just... doesn't really matter what the content of the realization is. It's just when we have what I would call obviousness, 
it might be, oh, if I don't do this, then this happens, or if I do do this, then this happens. It's well, what it what I mean is that something in your own mind comes alive and gives you the inspiration to go forward. The content of it doesn't really matter. So let's carry on for a bit, and then we'll come um, to it. And will realization always turn into action? Yes. If it's a proper realization, it brings its own action. Right? It's 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 already it's like an app. It's already embedded in the system. It just comes with its own obviousness. So um, just want to. So what we're going to talk about a lot is how do realizations happen, right? Because the realizations are so powerful. How do we have more, right? Or well, what, what are realizations made of? Is there a pill I can have? A realization pill? Is there a widget on my phone? Sadly not. So we need to understand the mind. So we're going to talk about the mind now, okay? And start to see whether we can see where realizations come from. So. Quality of mind readdresses an innocent mistake we've made in, in understanding the mind. And one way of describing that is to look at two parts of our system, the mind. And one of those we call the conceptual mind. And the conceptual mind, or you could nickname this the hard drive if you want a metaphor, right? The conceptual mind is the thing that gets developed in us human beings from the age of about one years old. And it looks after our ability to acquire knowledge, facts, information, skills, um, to have judgment to, you know, sort of think, well, that's big, that's small, that's bad, that's happy, that's sad, that's what, you know, to differentiate and conceptualize judgment, to rationalize things, um, to make things fit into your own understanding, to categorize things, to make meaning and stories and narratives about things in our conditioning. And also the conceptual mind creates this thing we call the self, us. So if you, if you look at tiny babies, they have no sense of self. They don't see themselves as a separate entity. They don't even know they've got a body till a few months old. You know, so they stare at their hands and their feet, they're like, whoa. So all of this, this self ability for knowledge, intellect, uh, categorization, conceptualization, that's not part of the innate system. That's not, that's, we learn this. We learn this. Now, we're talking now about another part of the system, which we are gonna call the impersonal mind. So we're gonna call it the conceptual mind and the impersonal mind or the hard drive and the cloud, if you wanna give these little nicknames. Now, the impersonal mind has the capacity for realization. That's innate, that's already in it. Now we'll come to more about how we get in the way of it and how we have more in a moment. It also has the ability for inspiration, to be resilient, to bounce forward, to have clarity, to go from not to being confused to not being confused, to seeing what to do, to have common sense, to be creative, to find meaning and purpose in something you're doing, to connect and feel part of something greater than just you, the, the universe, the planet, the world, nature, other people. And of course, all our bodily functions. No one here right now is using their psychology to digest their lunch or make their heart beat or breathe. No one is using their psychology to do that. That happens. So all of these things we would call the impersonal mind now, what in the, in the world that we live in, especially in our busy worlds nowadays, we kind of need to both of these because the left-hand side helps us navigate, not get run over by a bus and know how to use a computer and um, invent lovely things in the world. Very helpful. And it helps us have a rich, you know, lots of stories and narratives about things that are going on. And it gives us all our individual uniqueness. And the right hand side provides all the connection, love, inspiration, fresh thinking, realization, and evolves the system. And when we're in flow, we're in a beautiful dance, balance between these two. Now, the innocent mistake is that we've tried to develop the right hand side, all that foundational resourcefulness and connection and productivity using the left hand side. We've tried to use our psychology to get more of the right. 
We've tried to do it through tools and techniques and strategies. And I spent 10 years teaching those strategies and tools and techniques. And it kind of works, <laughs> kind of works, but it's nowhere near as good as what we're going to be showing you. <laughs> and what's also happened is that conventional education and human development has, has focused on the left. Most of our education at schools, most of what we do in the workplace, most of what society values actually is the left hand side. It, it values the intellect. It values being very evidence based about everything, being very rational. And the real question I think is fascinating is how does the right hand side work? What's it made of? Because trying to develop it through the left hand side doesn't really work because they're different parts of the system and you get you get a kind of poor imitation of something. So people used to come to me when I was, you know, this is back, back 15 years ago. How do I have more rapport? How do I have more connection? How do I have more creativity? And I would give them tools and techniques and strategies. And it sort of worked, but it was nothing like the real, real connection and rapport and creativity that comes from source. So what quality of mind looks at is how does that right hand side work? And, and actually what gets in the way on the left hand side that stops that right hand side working? Now, I'm hoping that that makes a little bit of sense when we put it in that framework, that we've over-indexed on the conceptual mind and we've misunderstood the right-hand side, the, the impersonal mind, and we tried to get to the impersonal mind via the, the conceptual mind. And PS, we don't know we're doing that. <laughs> I didn't know I was doing that <laughs> for 35 years. I didn't realize I was doing that. So that's what we're going to look at. So, but for, but I want to just do a little experiment with you, right? So g go with me on something right now. Okay. Go with me on something right now. I mentioned the word flow. Just in, in your, as you're sitting in your chairs right now, just close your eyes down if you like, put your feet flat on the floor and just allow your mind to go to a time when you had flow. What we mean by flow is that things were just happening. It felt you maybe you're doing a hobby or a sport or you're at work and you were just at your, your, your very best. There was an ease to it. There was a grace. Uh, things just occurred to you. There was a lightness to it. There was possibility. It, it felt like it wasn't even really you doing it, although it was you doing it. Take yourself back there for a moment. See it, hear it, feel it, smell it, breathe it. Allow it to come into the mind. And as you do that, just notice how it feels. Just notice some of the sensations. Notice some of the sensations as you see it happening right in front of you right now. Feel that in your bodies and the sensation. Whatever it was. It might have been just a lovely conversation with a friend. You might have been doing sport. You might have been being creative at work. You might have been in a team meeting. You might have been with your children. It doesn't really matter what it was, but you were in flow. You might have been cooking dancing, singing. So what did it feel like and how resourceful is that space? And then just put a few things in the chat when, when you're done. Put a few things in the chat about what it felt like and how resourceful you felt. So inspired, motivated, physically better, emotionally lighter. Finding innovation and creativity is easy. Didn't feel time. Wow, yeah. Happy, valuable, excited, vibrant, energized. Yeah, keep the words coming. Good stuff. Something was moving me. Yeah, it feels like you're, it's not always you. It's something bigger than you. Alive, effortless. Oh, it's great words. Great feelings you are in. Now, can you imagine if you were like that more of the time <laughs> in any aspect of work or life, wouldn't that be better? It would be easier. Brilliant. So you all got a little bit of a sense of that, a sensational sense of that. 
Yeah, sense of direction and action. So clarity comes out of it. Okay, nice. So that's what we're pointing to. We're pointing to how can we have more of that flow with all the things it brings without having to do it through willpower, tools and techniques, and telling yourself to do it. Because telling yourself to get in flow doesn't really work. <laughs> Some people do mindfulness for five hours a day and yoga for the other three hours a day and journaling for the other two hours a day and then work for an hour a day. And you know, you could do it again. That's hard work. You get there, but it's hard work. We're talking about a way that's more organic. So how do we have more of it? How do we have more of that flow? How do we have more of that quality of mind? Well, we have to look at the mind differently. We have to look at the mind differently to how we've been conditioned. But let's ask a question for you now. Just, you might have already been doing this as we've been talking, but where do you think, again, no right or wrong, when we're in high quality of mind and when we're in low quality of mind, so when we're in flow or out of flow, where do you think that comes from? What do you think determines whether we're in high quality of mind or low quality of mind? What do you think determines that? And put some words in the chat. So maybe if you're in a high for purpose, low for fear. So, right, so stress might cause it, fear. So I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate this as you're typing in. Does it, you know, you could look at it like the adversity, you know, things not going well in life, whether that's your health, your wealth, your family, you know, does that equal low quality of mind? And on the other side, does it look like, you know, what, if things are going well with all those things, then you're going to get high quality of mind. What does it look like to you? Tapping into another dimension naturally, yeah. Wow. Low energies, demotivation equals low, yeah. And think about how it's what society tells us, the media tells us. What does the, me the media will tell us, you know, when things are going well, then we feel good. You know, even when you do those, some of those magazines have a survey about stress. And then, you know, if you're doing it, if, if you're moving house, you get 50 stress points. If you're getting divorced, 100 stress points, new job, 15 stress points, um, you know, children messing around, 10 stress points. Society kind of points to the fact that our quality of mind comes from the outside. So what does it look like to you? Okay, some good things in the chat here. So whatever you, so people tend to answer this question quite differently depending on how they see it, right? So what we want to point to is that whatever you, it, it can look different, right? In different moments. And it might appear that your quality of mind is determined either by outside, you know, like situations, other people, events, circumstances. So there's COVID. There's lockdown, low quality of mind. People losing their jobs. You know, there's bad econ economy, economy, economics going on. So low quality of mind. Or when lockdown ends, we'll feel better. So, the, the, so sometimes it looks like it's, it's the outside world does it. Sometimes it looks like it's me. So a lot of your messages in the chat were going, what to do with how I feel about my motivation, right? So it's like me, my thoughts. So if I have good thoughts, I have good quality of mind. If I feel motivated, I have good quality of mind. So it looked like it's your, it's you, you, the person, you, the self. And sometimes it might look like, well, it just kind of happens through me. I think a couple of you mentioned that in the message. It just sort of, woof, it's not even really me. It's not even really the outside world. The outside world actually comes from all that. So it just happens. So it would look like it could appear to come from any of those three. And sometimes, would it be fair to say in different moments it comes from different ones? It would look like it comes from different ones? It would appear to come from different ones? 
First thing we want to spot is just because something appears to be a, a certain way, it isn't, right? At the moment, the world, the planet, is, the globe is spinning at about 100 miles an hour at the equator. It doesn't look like that to me at the moment. Doesn't, I don't think I'm spinning, right? But it is. It looks like there's a sunrise and sunset. It isn't, right? So just because it appears to work a certain way doesn't mean it does. Because the mind plays tricks on us. <laughs> I'm just going to answer one question. Does quality of mind refer to state of mind processing? Uh, quality of mind is a little bit before that. So your state of mind could be a symptom of your quality of mind, and that might determine how much you process. But we're, we're pointing to something a little bit broader and bigger than, than, quality, than uh, state of mind processing. And I would try not to compare it to that. Um, or I wouldn't try, I'd try and compare it to nothing, actually, just to see what you see. So the point we're saying is, that often we might be told that quality of mind comes from the outside or us. We want to point to the fact that the quality of mind doesn't come from the outside, doesn't come from us. Actually, your quality of mind determines your outside and your me. We'll come on to that. We'll come on to that because I realized that was like, whoa, what's that all about? But we'll come there. <laughs> but we're looking at how it might appear at the moment. So another little experiment for you, just to see what, how, what our minds are like. So a little experiment, and everyone can do this. It takes one minute, right? So the first thing you need to do for one minute is have one thought and no other thoughts. Right, so you have to do, just get one thought and have that thought and no other thought and see how long you can do that for. Right, so pick a thought and don't have any others. Now, I imagine that won't last very long, right? Because you're going to have another thought now, because I'm even talking to you is another thought, right? Can you hold one thought for very long? No. No. <laughs> it's gone. Uh-oh. You might have managed five seconds. The, whoa, it's very difficult, right? <clears throat> now, the second yeah. part of this, have no thoughts. Nothing. Right? See if you can do that for one minute. We are thinking about not thinking, so it is a thought. Yes, exactly. Having the thought going, yeah, yeah I'm not thinking, is a thought. <laughs> Congratulating yourself on how well you've done on having no thoughts is a thought. <laughs> the mind thinks a lot. And it's like, you know, sometimes maybe you're... Uh, Maybe you're with someone and you're having, you're watching a sunset or, or your kids play or something. It's just a lovely moment. And one person says, isn't this lovely? And you're like, not now, you know, because they brought you out of that by commenting on it. <laughs> or you're trying to have a romantic moment and someone comments on how romantic the moment is. No, it takes you out. So the mind does what it does. We don't, we think we control the mind. We don't. We really, really don't. We think we can. We don't really control the mind. It's always moving. It's always moving. Now, it's a good thing about that. We're going to come on to why that's so helpful. But what a lot, we, what a lot of us try to do with our psychological approaches and tools and techniques and even our meditations and mindfulness is to try and control this thing. And actually, a lot of our challenge comes from trying to control it. Now, I'll give you some humans that don't try and control the mind. Two-year-olds. Now, they will have tantrums, but not for very long. You know, tantrum, they get very upset, but not for very long. And they don't care about their mind. They don't really try and control anything. Yet they spend most, more of their time in creativity and play and you know, connection than we do. <laughs> they don't control their minds. So we need to, we need to understand the mind, not try and control it, which we're coming to. So go back to our question. How do we get higher quality of mind? Now, where we're now going to point to where we focus with quality of mind, another way of saying it. Because if you think about what's going on for us in any moment, there's lots of things coming into our minds, thoughts, images, feelings, perceptions, sensations, always that, you know, we live in this vivid, animated, sensational world 
either what we call in our heads, like, oh, I'm having a thought about what I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm having a thought about yesterday. I'm having a, I'm daydreaming about this. Or what we call the outside world. I can see uh, a tree. I can see a car. I can see a, a screen. That's all in the content of our experience. Now, quality of mind to start with doesn't focus on the content of our experience. It doesn't focus on, you know, how to fix the outside world. I made to have better situations, better people, better circumstances. It doesn't, it doesn't leverage it by trying to change the outside world. The outside world does change, but not because we, we try it there. And we don't try and change the inside world that you have. Your, your beliefs, your programming, your conditioning, your goals. That's a lot of what I used to do, neurolinguistic programming, all that kind of stuff, was trying to shift our belief systems. And if you have a better inside world, you have a better outside world. We're not really focusing there either. We're focusing upstream, what we call upstream, before the brain, pre-brain, pre-psychology. You might think, well, what's there? Is there anything there? <laughs> Where are you going? There's nowhere to go. Well, there is some stuff there. We just don't see it. And when you focus on the nature of the mind, pre-brain, pre-psychology, or what we call before psychology, the inside world and the outside world start to change by themselves through realization, through emergence. So we're talking about where we focus now, because with quality of mind, you start to understand what you're not seeing and realizing about the mechanics of the mind that is turning up in the content of your experience. But we, we usually have been told, if you want to fix what things, fix it downstream, ignoring the nature of the system. Now it's a little bit, sometimes a bit, people find it a little bit difficult to readjust to go upstream, but you might get a sense of it by the end of these, these uh, three hours. So we're not, we're not focusing the leverage point on trying to shift your behavior or your outside world, or even who you think you are at a personality level. We're going one level above. So we're going to get a little deeper for a moment. Okay. Bear in mind, we're going to have a break in about kind of, I don't know, maybe halfway through. So bear with it, bear with us if you can. Okay. And then a little tea break, but let's get deeper for a moment, if you don't mind. So now how to get the most out of this, listen fresh. You know, I said that at the beginning, I really mean it now, right? I was only half meaning it before, really mean it now. Because we're going to talk about something that might be a bit. So the mind is a load more than we thought or than I thought. And even science now, and this is even in the last sort of 10 years, pioneering scientists realized we might have got it wrong on how human experience works how reality works on the nature of the brain, because we were told really that the brain is the epicenter. You know, the brain is the middle of everything and everything comes from the brain. This thing we call consciousness and what consciousness means is you, as a human being, you can have a sentient experience. You can smell garlic, you can taste vanilla, you can enjoy chocolate, you can feel velvet, you can get annoyed with Donald Trump, you can fall in love with Brad Pitt, you know, whatever it is that we do in our minds, that's all consciousness. The ability to have an experience is consciousness. And science has been trying to find the source of consciousness in the brain. Knowing consciousness happens and going, well, where it's in the brain somewhere, we can't find it. And they can't find it. They can't find what causes it. They can't find what causes it. They've been looking, they can find lots of things that correlate to it, but not what causes it, which makes you think something, maybe it doesn't start there. That maybe the self and matter, you know, protons and atoms and molecules and all that kind of stuff, isn't what creates the mind. The mind creates the matter, mind over matter, right? <laughs> Because the only thing that we absolutely know is that we've never experienced an outside world without a mind. Has anyone ever 
experience the outside world, you know, trees and people, not through their mind. No, you haven't. I, well, I'm sure you haven't because you're a human being. You have to have experienced it. Even scientists have only ever experienced the outside world through the mind. So we know there's a, we, we know there's a mind, what we're calling a mind, but we don't know anything else. So the idea that this stuff called the material world, which our brains are made of, then creates consciousness does seem a bit odd. And maybe, 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 maybe it's the other way around. I'll, I'll come on to why this is relevant because we're not doing a science lesson here. Um, but it's just to help disrupt what we think we've been conditioned so innocently and invisibly. So if our consciousness isn't created from matter, you know, from, from, the, from the material world. And, and, you know, the more they look into matter and they make it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, they still can't find it. It makes you start to think that maybe we are more than just what we thought we were. So what we think is creating our experience and sourced by the brain probably isn't. The brain's involved, of course, you know, the brain's involved. Like if you put a big electromagnet next to a particular hemisphere of our brain, half of your vision goes black and white. If you pump chemicals into our system, like uh, cocaine or vodka or ayahuasca, it does things to our perceptual view of the world. So we know the brain's involved, but it's not the source. But we've been very much taught, most of us, particularly in the Western world, that the brain is where it's all at. And it's all about, you know, that. So, therefore, this is where it gets more into resourcefulness, quality of mind and psychology. The outside world and the brain are not the direct causes of the human experience that we once thought they were. So what does this mean? So what, so what, so what? Because I'm probably losing you for a bit here, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you're like, yeah, of course, but we know that. Um, we, we've, what we come up with is a kind of way of thinking about reality that's different to how we've been taught. Because if it isn't how it appears, then we've misunderstood the system and therefore we're not getting the best out of it. And we've done that before. We've got, we've got, we've got form in this as a species, right? For a while, we thought the earth was flat. We were pretty convinced. We also thought the sun, you know, went round the earth. And then we were like, oh, no, <laughs> it's not that. And then everyone went, of course it isn't. Right. So maybe we've been wrong about this, too. It's possible, right? It's possible. Now, I'm not saying take my word. I'm saying explore this. Explore this for you. Don't take my word at all. This is not a cult. Explore it. <laughs> you decide. So what we're going to say is to try and make this easier or simpler to, to conceptualize is that how reality turns up for us, any of us, is in an experience that we would call real, but not true, never true. Right, so what do we mean by real? What do we mean by never true? So real points to the idea. The outside world or the inside world is real for you. It's sentient, you smell it, see it, hear it, feel it. You're not pretending, you're not making it up. You know, you're not, you know, it's, it's real for you. That is what's going on for you, whether you're sick or well or five years old or 80 years old or a man or a woman or drunk or sober, you know, it's all real. But it's never true. And what we mean by true is it doesn't exist objectively outside of the mind. It doesn't exist objectively outside of the mind that's what we mean by never true so we've been taught that there's a kind of a world out there the mind's a bit like a camera and what is going on we take in through our senses these eyes and ears and things and then we might interpret it a little bit we might put a bit of photoshop on it right but it's really fundamentally out there so there are such things as bad experiences there are such things as that is happening that is happening and then I'm interpreting that. We're saying no, there's no truth objectively. Can I ask a so, question? 
Yes, it might, you might, it might, the answer might be coming up, but ask it and then I'll tell you whether okay, it is so or not. So I just want to make sure that the train of thought that I'm in is, is in the right path. Um, so we're both, we're all experiencing this, this uh, training right now, right? We're all, it's happening. So this is real. We're experiencing it through our five senses. Um, but how we're experiencing it, that's the, that's what's never, not true. Is that it? Um, it's a bit more than that. I mean, it is that. And I guarantee if we ask every single one of us on here, how's the training going, they'd all describe it differently. And there's a few people who aren't experiencing it at all, even though their names are here, right? So there is that. But actually, even more than that, as, it, as, it, as, as the 25 or 35 human beings on this, most of us are having a similar experience of the training, similar, let's say, oh, there's a screen, it's Zoom, right? Now, is any single one of us experiencing that outside of the mind? No. Does it exist outside of the mind? We don't know. Does it, is, is it happening? Or is it just the fact that as a species, we have similar perceptual interface, right? And a shared consciousness. Therefore, it appears to us that it's all happening to us, right? Now, there could be some people who are sitting staring at their screen right now and having an experience of something completely different. And it'd be wrong of us, the 34 who aren't doing that, to go, well, you're wrong, I'm right. So that what we're pointing to is, whereas as a human being, we will have similar experiences to each other, and therefore we could point to the fact there's an outside world, a, no one's ever experienced an outside world, ever, right? And B, that experience is so variable that it's difficult to say exactly what the outside world would be even if there was one. And C, I suppose scientists have never found an outside world. We've never found one, but we've been taught there's an outside world because it looks like there is. Now, if you think about it, let's take an example whereby um, you can't find your car keys right and you run around the house trying to find them trying to find them trying to find them and you come back and they're right there and you're like oh well where were they did someone put them there or you know when you can't you see a mistake in um something like a a number spreadsheet or a piece of an email a, a, ty a typo you're like oh where was that or the optical illusions you know there's lots of optical illusions where the mind just does its best guess. So there's, there's, a, there's a scientist called Anil Seth, and I'll send you a link to him afterwards. And he says that we're always hallucinating, but when we agree on the hallucination, we call it reality. So we're always hallucinating, but when we agree on the hallucination, we call it reality. Unless you're the next president of the US, and then you say, no, it's not reality, right? Um, little joke there political one sorry but you know so people have you can see people having very different experiences of the same thing and they're in their own world they're going well i don't see it like that so but the key point we're saying here is that no one's ever found an objective reality no one so it seems odd that there would be an objective reality that we're all experiencing and then just filtering we could spin it around but bear with this because i think it might come through okay so what we're saying is that we don't just make up the stuff in our world, we make up the world as well. Because most of us are okay with the idea that we have our own interpretation of stuff. Oh yeah, I kind of see that differently to you. No, we're saying we make it all up. Helpfully so, helpfully so sometimes. A lot of the time, helpfully. That's why we don't get run over when we're crossing the road. But we believe our thoughts as truth and they're not. That's, the, that's what we think. Now, let's put this on a little continuum. It might help you, right? So sometimes things will appear to us as 100% real and true, right? So let's say for someone, if you lose your job uh, and have to move house or something, whatever it might be, that's real and true. That That, that is those things happening to me, those circumstances are real and true and they're going to make me feel bad. Or let's, let's even be a little bit more morbid. You know, someone you love passes away. Well, that will, that is real and true. 
And my experience of that is fixed. You know, that's just bad. That's just sad. That's just awful. Right? That's how they see that. It's 100% real and true. Now, just look at the full spectrum. There are some things that we would say, well, yeah, sometimes that looks real and true and fixed. And sometimes it doesn't. It's kind of a mixture. I kind of see it. Let's say, let's say you're thinking about something you have to do at work and your confidence. You would go, well, yeah, sometimes I feel confidence about doing that, that presentation or that new idea or that new job role. And sometimes I don't. And it can change in the moment. And you kind of know some of it's your mind. You kind of go, well, that's sort of me. And yeah, I know I've got my doubts. But you kind of think it's a mixture of real and true. Right, some things that look up, appear, appear 100% real and true. Some things would look like, okay, well, that one doesn't look as fixed. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So it might be another person. Let's say there's someone you find it difficult to get on with. And you're like, well, that's just because they are how they are. That might be 100% real and true. And then sometimes you're like, oh, they weren't too bad today. Yeah, I can deal with them. That's like a mix. And then there's some things that we would go, yeah, that's real for me, but I know it's not true. You know, something very neutral on. The best example of the human being doing this, you know, in the mornings, you can wake up and you're still in your dream. You can feel your dream and it's, your heart is pumping, you know, you can feel it, taste it, smell the dream even. It's real, very real. Dreams are very real. But would you ever say they were true? No, it's just my mind. Now, what we're saying, now this is a bit weird, everything in our experience, our reality, whether waking or dreamy, is the same. It's all real but not true. But it appears, appears sometimes 100% real and true, sometimes real and not true, and sometimes in the middle. It's how it appears. But it's always that white box on the right-hand side. Now, sometimes you'll see something move on this continuum, this spectrum, after a realization, right? So something looked like, something looked real and true to you, looked real and true, you have a realization, then you're like, oh, no, I can do that. Maybe running five miles, or um, riding a bicycle, or giving it smoking, or, um, earning a certain amount of money, you're like, oh, I don't think I can ever do that. No, no, that's, that's not me. It's not who I am. And then it happens. So it shifts. Now we're saying once you realize, not just know, but realize everything is always on that right hand side, but it just, just doesn't appear like that, then you have a lot of psychological freedom, which we'll come into. But the, the foundation thing we're pointing to here, which is a really, really big thing, is that the way the mind works is much more like a uh, VR headset in that our realities are perceptually generated moment to moment. They render. The mind creates something in the moment from, with, from the mind. It's not even from the brain. From the mind, which looks then very real. Feels, sounds real. Just like a VR you know, virtual reality, VR headset would, would work. Whereas we've been conditioned to think the mind's more like a camera. So it's much more like VR headset than camera, the mind. And what it creates is a real looking reality that sometimes appears very true, <laughs> sometimes appears a mixture and sometimes doesn't. But it's always real but not true. Now, I get that's quite a big thing to reckon with, to wrestle with. But even if you start to get a little sense of it, it'll be helpful. I'll, gi I'll give you an example, a personal example for me, right? So this is a real one. So about five years ago, I got divorced. What wasn't my idea, it wasn't what I wanted. Um, wasn't in the plan at all. <laughs> you know, two lovely children, I wanted to live with them. And, and a lovely wife I wanted to be with. And Fairly quickly, I could see that I could get over the heartbreak of not being with my wife. But the thing that stuck with me for a few more months was I 
can't see how I can be the dad I want to be, the father I want to be, with my children living in another house with an, um, uh, another, because um, my ex-wife got married again, with another guy. I, I can't see how I can be the dad I want to be. That looked, that didn't, that looked kind of in the red box or the pink box for me, right? Red box a bit for three months. And then I just saw that that was not true. I was like, ah, huh? oh yeah, of course I can. I'll be different. I won't have them every day, but I'll still, I'll be, I can still be a great dad. I'll just be a different kind of dad. But it didn't look like that, that for me for, for a few months. I was like, no, that's postcode. That's proximity. That's location. That's to do with time spent. That's not to do with the mind. I couldn't imagine it that I could be happy or be a good dad. And then that just a few months later, I was like, oh yeah, of course I can. What? I, I, it was very odd for me. It just shifted. So just a personal example of how it moved. And we have our own things on this line. If you, if you start thinking now, you'll put your own things in here going, oh yeah, I can see where it is. <laughs> and maybe think of ones that were on the left and have moved to the right. If that's how you're looking at your screen, from the red to the white. So, just I'll, I'll, I'll try and take an implication of that, right? An implication of real and never true is there's no causal power, I mean direct causal power, outside of the mind, outside of you. There's no circumstance, situation, the past, the future, other people that dictates a reality for you. None, never. So the mind might look like it's a camera, but actually it's a projector. And it's not, and by the way, the self, the you is not the projector. There's, there's a source behind that, but we'll come on to that, right? So it's not, there's a world out there that does stuff to you. The outside world of circumstances, events, situations have no direct causal power to make us see or feel anything. Never. It looks like they can. So, but we will live in a world where it looks like that. And it's always like this, but depending on our aperture, and we're going to talk about aperture after the tea break, um, we may see that or may not see that. So, no thing, no event, no nothing, no body, no person can put a feeling or an experience in you. No economy, no politics, no COVID, no boss, no partner, no child can do that. They have there's no causal power there. And when we see that, we have psychological freedom. Doesn't mean it won't happen, right? It's real, remember? But once you realize it, we have some freedom. Now, I realize it's quite a big concept, but does it make, are you getting a little sense of this? Just, just put something in the chat to see whether this is making zero sense, 50 cents sense, 100 percent sense. Where, where are you at? <laughs> it's something to reflect on and ponder on for the days and weeks and months and years to come. But do you get what the pointing is? Good. Right, it's something in consent. Still where we started. Mohammed, tell me what you mean by that. Still where we started. Okay. Sorry, I'm I'm just looking for where my unmute was. Uh, so I think I'm getting like uh, the points separately. It, it's making sense somewhere, but making sense of the whole thing as as topic i'm still not there i'm thinking maybe once we proceed further i'll get okay. there but but so far but i still didn't reach there okay yeah there's more of the puzzle to come right <laughs> there's more of the jigsaw to come yeah now okay good good i'm with you right so what I just want to touch on now before we break is some of the things that kind of get in the way of this, right? And then after the break, we'll talk about how they dissolve again. 
because we have that although we have this beautiful experience of real and never true and psychological freedom we have that highly developed conceptual mind right that most of us have spent years investing in <laughs> and society's been reinforcing now and that turns up in various ways in psychological phenomena which we're just going to touch on a few right so one thing that we do the mind does the personal mind on the, on the left hand side remember the conceptual mind right it meaning makes and it creates what we call layers layers of meaning layers of thinking that look really justified right and the personal mind's job is to visibly and invisibly that's the problem invisibly seek meaning validation through the conditioning so it, it's information seeking it's, it's rationalization seeking and then it starts to look at the world and then judge it and justify it right and it's very helpful that it does that <laughs> but it's also very limiting and mentally quite noisy do you know those things a snow globe do you know those things that when you there's a little glass thing and when you shake them they get all like things and the picture gets very uh difficult to see and when it settles you can see the picture clearly our minds are like that right our minds start to make lots of meaning and get caught up in things and then when you when they when the aperture expands again you're like oh yeah and it does that visibly in the snow globe but almost worse it does that invisibly now if you want to spot this probably the easiest layers to spot will be judgment or justification so justification in my story i just gave you you know i thought it'd be difficult for me to be a great dad and i was right because they they don't live in the same house as me there's another dad there um that you know i'm not going to see them as often um but you know there are my justifications for why i was right you ask anyone whether they think the vaccine's a good idea or a bad idea, whether they think Brexit's a good idea or a bad idea, you know, they'll have justifications. Not many adults go, I don't know. Children are great at saying, I don't know. You ask a five-year-old, did you have fun at school? They say, yes. You say, why? They go, I don't know. They just stare at you. I don't know. Their, their conceptual mind has not made anything up yet. <laughs> and we actually tell them, you have to have a reason. If they change their mind, children, on what to have for food, we tell them off because they have no reason for changing their mind. So they go, right, must get reasons, must have reasons, must justify, must justify. At school, they're told to justify everything. If they have an idea, they can't have original thought. It must be justified, right? So we justify, 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 and we judge. We judge ourselves and we judge others. You know, you walk around in lockdown. What's that person doing out? They shouldn't be out. They should wear a mask. They should get a vaccine. <laughs> and we judge ourselves, of course. Now, it's fine we make meaning. It's fine we layer as long as we see it as real and never true. If we see our meaning as real and true, we're in trouble. Because it reduces our clarity, it reduces our potential, and it creates even mental suffering. Stress, anxiety, procrastination are all layering. That's all stress and anxiety and procrastination are. Yes, but I have to feel pressure or else I won't perform. That's, that's justification. Now, I'll tell you later on how we can tell the difference between the good, the good layering and the, and the bad layering. But if we see our meaning as real and true, our layers as real and true, rather than real and never true, then we're going to suffer or struggle. Another thing we do is what we call invisible lids. So the way the mind works is that we can't see, we can't tell that the mind has created a perception of something that is limited. We've, you know, and in a way that's kind of helpful, otherwise we'd be constantly thinking what, what's next. But we get in these situations where we think that's what it is and we don't realize it's the mind. Now, I'll tell you a little example of this. I don't know whether anyone, a few years ago, there was a thing that went around the internet. It was a dress. And it was 
people either saw it as blue and black or gold and kind of cream. Do you, I don't know if you saw that. And if you were one of the persons that saw it as blue and black, and you were next to a person that saw it as white and cream, you would just go, well, yours is different or you're wrong. No, it's the mind. <laughs> no one was right and wrong in that scenario. It was just the mind. And it's quite easy to see on an illusion like that. But that's how the world is, that we go around making limits to how we see things and then assuming that's the world, not the mind. <clears throat> so our perceptions look real, but are never true. But we can't see that we can't see that sometimes. So we just think that's how it is. So someone will say, I need to earn this much money to be OK. And they won't think that's their mind that will they will think that's what it is. So we'll place limits and boundaries on our perception. <clears throat> and then think that's the world doing it, not the mind. And then we act on that. And actually, here's something to consider. Every time we think we do that. Every thought is a limitation. Even the thought that says there's no limitation. <laughs> because we, our imagination is bound to be in our conceptual mind, right? If it's formed into thought, it's already limited. If it's formed into thought, it's already limited. Infinite exists in the space between thought. Thought is limiting. Now, it's very helpful thought because it helps you decide how to open the door or what to have for dinner. So we need it, but it's limiting. Not limiting in a bad way always. Sometimes it is. <clears throat> now, we can't stop having invisible lids. It's just the nature of what we are. It's kind of what we are. But, but we can get much better at noticing, acknowledging, respecting that that's what we're doing. And that's the problem. It's not the problem isn't that we do layers and lids It's that we think they're made of the world, not the mind. <clears throat> now, here's another one we do. I wonder how many times you've done this today. Um, tried to control or wanted to predict the future. We are very conditioned to worry about the future. I mean, lockdown and COVID has been a spectacular example of that. Everyone wants to know when's it ending? When can I be okay? <laughs> I'll be okay when this happens, right? So <clears throat> the future is impossible to predict because it comes from the mind, full stop. That's why it's impossible to predict. You could say it hasn't happened yet, but then nor's really the reality either. But so it comes from the mind. So it's impossible to predict and we have no idea how we'll be about what it is anyway. We would just be guessing through thought. So we can't predict it. And knowing that there is a, a deeper intelligence in us that will deal with whatever needs to be dealt with, that comes through realization, inspiration and resilience. Really, given those two things, we don't have so the need that we think we do in order to try and control it. And this seeking of certainty that we have is way over indexed. So a lot of the times we are layered up is because of about the future. If you think about it, we're doing it all the time. So that's another thing that our conceptual mind does. The left hand side of that diagram at the beginning does. It tries to predict and control the future, thinking the self needs to know. It doesn't. So just to, we've got the we've got the layering, we've got the lids, we've got the need to predict and control the future. And I'll give you the one more that we do. The other one we do is to what extent do we realize that we live in what we would call separate realities? So our conceptual mind generates our own, if you like, desktop interface of reality that we navigate by, which looks real to us, looks real, never true, but looks real. And 
were six billion or however many are in the planet nowadays, fractals of that, right? All doing our own tiny little version of that on the conceptual mind. We're all the same on the impersonal mind, we're all separate on the uh, conceptual mind. Now, when we're in a contracted aperture, we forget that we're all living in separate realities. And instead, we expect other people to see the world like us. So we'll think, oh yeah, well, they'll, they'll see it similar to me. And then if they don't, if someone doesn't see the world the same to you, you, you judge either them for being wrong or you for not thinking like them. Like there's a right way of seeing it, which they're doing and I'm not, or there's a right way of seeing it, which I am and they're not. <laughs> and we forget that it's impossible to see the world the same as someone else, not exactly the same. And when we don't recognize this, that's when we feel like isolation, disconnection, judgment, discomfort. But really, it's really obvious that we live in separate realities. So we just need to spot it more. Again, we can't stop this happening. It's like the lids, you can't stop it, but you can spot it. But how often would we assume someone else should see it like us? There's a, there's a better way of seeing the world. We all were all doing it. Okay, little little test on this. What do you think is going on in this picture? Put, put something in the chat. What do you think is going on? What do you think caused this picture? What's, what's going on for that lady? Maybe it's not a lady. What do you think is going on? Is she being chased? Is she waiting for a friend? Is she waiting for a truck to come past before she can move out? Is she wondering why she's got the wrong shoes on for cycling? Has she dropped something? Is she angry? Is she happy? <laughs> Where is she? Who knows? How old is she? Right, do you see what I mean? One simple tiny picture. We don't know. Now it's easy on a picture like this to see, oh yeah, of course we're gonna have different views. It's much more difficult when it's the world. <laughs> so let me just re recap back, let me recap back. Okay, we're gonna have a break in a minute. So we, we started off with this strange idea. Maybe it's not strange. That maybe science has got it backwards. The, what we see out there in the world isn't out there in an objective world. It's mind first and that creates the appearance of a world and that world will look real to us, but it's never objectively true because no one's ever experienced the world outside of the mind. And then what happens is that will look in different levels of real and true to us, depending on our aperture, right? But we're making the world up as we go along really. But sometimes it looks really true that we're, true that, that it is the world that it's fixed it's a world out there that has causal power but we're saying there's no causal power there's nothing in the world of the past the future circumstances situations other people that determines your reality nothing but we don't always see that and then we're saying that our conceptual mind will create these psychological phenomena which layers up thought, meaning makes, justifies things, judges things, which can create a lot of limitation for us. And it can be very noisy and difficult to navigate the world. I don't know what to do, but invisible lids, we limit perception, helpfully often, unhelpfully at other times. Every thought's a limitation. We can't stop doing it, but we can get better at noticing it. And then what we also try and do is we try and predict and control our future thinking the future is a thing that we need to get right because there's a vulnerable self that can be struggle otherwise. Well, no, we can't predict the future. We've got no idea how we're going to feel and we don't need to because we've got the innate capacity for realization to deal with it. So there's no need or well, a lot less need to create control and certainty. And then the other thing we do is we think other people will see the world like us and we get annoyed when they don't. But we're all part of the same system. We're just different fractals of it. So let's have a little break now 
for your beverage of choice, as English, I will have tea, of course. Um, could we come back here in uh, 10 minutes time? So we're going to start again at quarter two. Um, I, don't, I think it's quarter to seven in Dubai. Is that right? I'll tell you what it is, GMT. It's, it's, yes, correct. Yeah. So 10 minutes to come back. Have a little think about this, please, whilst you're having your tea. So, so yeah, so come back at um, 6.45. I'll, we'll leave the Zoom on. And then after the break, we're going to talk about, well, how do I have more of it? How do I have that wider aperture? How does it work? And please drop any questions in the chat as we go that you want us to approach, um, address afterwards, because that would really help be helpful. So see you in nine minutes.
come back from your little break. Come on the camera if you are here, so I can tell you're back. Great, can see a few cameras starting to come. So, hello. Please uh, do put questions in the chat or put your little hand up. Well, may, may not come to you straight away, but we definitely will get to you. So I think we are difficult to tell whether we're all here, but I'm just going to assume we are, so I'll carry on. <laughs> um, whoever's recording, do you want to, re you're still recording? Is that good? Yeah. Do you think we're good to go? Yeah. So, welcome back. We're going to talk more this second half, uh, well, this last hour or so, about um, how do we get a sense of whether we're seeing the world as real and true, and we're caught up in our lids and layering and separate realities, or whether we're a more, more expansive kind of real and never true and just living life more from the impersonal mind as opposed to the conceptual mind. How do we get a sense of that? So we need to spot and realize that um, we kind of live life through the, an aperture of that conceptual mind. So an aperture, for those of you not familiar with the term, uh, a, a camera has an aperture that lets in light. It kind of is something that kind of expands, get to my camera, expands and contracts. It expands and contracts like an aperture. And that's a metaphor for our conceptual mind. And when we're in a more expanded aperture, there's more the impersonal mind and flow. When we're in a more contracted aperture, it's more the personal conceptual mind and the self. And what we're saying is that impersonal mind is always there behind, like, like the sun in the sky when there's clouds. And within that impersonal mind, in that true, what some people call true self or the I, there's an infinite potential for capacities of realization, for performance, well-being, resilience, creativity, connection, love. All those things are, are there. And that's what happens when we're in a more expanded aperture. The self dissolves and we're, we're accessing more of that capacity. Now that conceptual mind also is part of what we are and that contracts over that and it gets developed and conditioned over life. That's why if you look at little small children, two or three year old children, they're much more in the flow than we are as adults because they've got less conceptual conditioned mind to wade through. So it's okay that happens. We don't need to vilify it. We don't need to uh, have a go at ourselves about that. We just need to recognize it and see the nature of it and see that however real that contracted aperture looks, it's never ever true. So how? People love a how. It's a, it's a question our conceptual mind likes. Our conceptual mind loves to know how. How? Give me the five top tips, the tools. The, and that's what I was searching for in the first 10 years of my career. You know, the, I had so many tools and techniques through all my approaches. Now, what we're looking for now is how do we have more of that wonderful expanded aperture and resourcefulness in a more organic, natural way without needing to use psychological strategies, tools, techniques, that kind of stuff. How do we do that? Because two-year-olds can do it. <laughs> but we don't want to be two again because it's quite fun being an adult because you know more stuff, right? <laughs> How do we get the best of both worlds? Well, you notice something. The, the answer to the how is when. The answer to the how is when, when you notice the aperture. Now, what do we mean when we say aperture? What are we noticing here? What, what, are, we, what, what are we on about? 
right? Well, see whether you can notice this. See whether this makes sense. The, there's kind of indicators, there's sensational indicators. They're like feelings, but they're before feelings. Okay, these, these are not feelings per se. These are not actual feelings. These are before feelings. They're sensations. Now, these are just some words written here. Okay, don't take them literally or prescriptively. They're just words to indicate where your aperture could be. So on the more contracted aperture, when things feel a little tight or tense or heavy, they might feel a little bit pressing, overwhelmed. They might feel urgent. I must do that. I must send the email. I must do this. I must do that. You might feel more self, more self-conscious, more, there's more of you involved. There's more me in it. You're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about how you're coming across or what you need to do or this to self, the self's there. You might be quite withdrawn. So you feel disconnected from what source. Strong emotions. Even the ones that we would call good, like protest, are a contracted aperture. Urges, I need a biscuit, I, I need a cookie, I need, I need a Facebook like, I need to buy shoes, I need that person to do this, an urge, you know, a strong urge. They, they tend to be sensational indicators of a lower aperture, contracted aperture. And on the other side, when things feel light, expansive, clear, obvious there isn't a lot of thinking flow energized some of the words you said earlier actually connected open sense of space time may distort that's more expanded aperture now my guess is whatever words you put to this you can probably sense or notice times when you've been around this different places on this spectrum. Now, it's really key. I used to often try and find out my state of mind or my aperture by asking myself, what mood am I in? What state of mind am I in? I used to ask myself, I'm, I'm going to keep an eye on this, I'm going to pay attention to it. And I used to use my mind to tell me about my mind. There's a problem with using your mind to tell you about your mind. <laughs> the mind is in it. <laughs> so thoughts are not as good indicators of aperture than sensation is. Because how many times have you uh, asked, you know, someone has told you that they're very open to listen to you. They're very open-minded. And you think, oh, good, thank you. I'm glad you're open. And then five minutes into the conversation, you realize, no, they're not. <laughs> but they think they are. They're not even lying to themselves. But if they notice the sensation they're in, they would feel a bit tight. But the other problem is, this is why it's invisible, is this normalizes. A lot of people are comfortably numb or live life in their heads is a phrase. And actually, only occasionally will they have that expanded aperture feeling, maybe on holiday after four days, maybe on uh, the end of a weekend. Maybe very occasionally doing a thing they really, really love, or they get a little bit of that expanded aperture, but then they think at work, I can't have that. That's a, that's a weekend feeling. Or that's a feeling when I'm with my children. Or that's a holiday feeling. No, 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 no. Those feelings and sensations are never to do with the event. We're just very normalized. So we need to start to spot, notice, without judging, without judging, neutral noticing these sensations. Now, what you'll find is that when we are in the different phases of the aperture, we have different things available to us, right? And what we call the inbuilt design for success, or you could nickname them the superpowers are available in a more expanded aperture. So what do we mean by that? Well, the very thing we started talking about right at the beginning was realization. The capacity for realization is inbuilt into the system. And whenever you're in a more expanded aperture, you are more fertile, more likely to have realization. 
So the, the, the personal mind contracts the aperture and takes us out of realization. But everyone can have realization. You're not limited in your life to only having a hundred. You know, it's infinite. It's there. And you can't force a realization with your thinking mind. You can't ask yourself a realization. But in an open aperture, you have more. And that solves so many things. Realization is our capacity to not only survive, but thrive. It updates the personal mind to where it needs to be to deal with the reality that's showing. Inspiration, that's available in, a, in an open aperture. Now, the funny thing about inspiration is that we think certain things inspire us. Oh, I find that work very inspiring. I find that book very inspiring. I find that song very inspiring. I find that person very inspiring. Now, is it the thing? Is it the person, the, the, the situation, the book? No, it's the aperture. Because when you're in an open aperture, the most boring things, what we might call boring things, are inspiring. I, small children, again, are a great way of looking at this. I remember when my, my, when my children was about two or three years, maybe three or four years old, we went to the zoo to see all the animals, amazing animals, and I thought, wow, they're going to love it. The thing he loved the most was the tiny little card he got at the end with a picture of a gorilla. That inspired him. The real gorilla didn't. I was like, how, how? he was fascinated by this card. Stood it, stared at it the whole way home. Wow, that inspired him. <laughs> Could have saved a lot of money, right? <laughs> Just give him a little card, didn't need to go to the zoo. So it's not the thing, but we attribute our inspiration to a thing. It's the aperture, not the thing. Inspiration is available about anything if the mind is not making stories about it. And you might have found that something you used to find really boring and tedious, you now quite enjoy. Lockdown, people have found that they found even doing the housework can be quite inspiring, you know. Well being. Now, there's a lot of stories around well being about some people being broken and whatever, but it's it's there. We all have mental health in an open aperture. It's the personal mind that creates all that distraction from that. So that's available for anyone. And I'm not being disrespectful to people that don't have well-being, <coughs> but they're probably looking in the wrong place for it. When the, when the personal mind stops doing its thing so much, you'll find a, a sense of peace and okayness, regardless to what the world's up to doesn't mean it's always going to be perfect, but, but your inner peace will be there. You, your sort of innate okayness. Balance. So we don't mean balancing on a tightrope. We mean balance in terms of uh, getting equilibrium and finding the right way to run your life, you know, juggling all the different pieces. That's a lot easier when we're in a wide aperture. When we're in a narrow aperture, we try and work it all out. But the system restores, it knows when to sleep and eat and rest and exercise. There's an intelligence in the system that restores it to balance. That's why health, you know, in our biology, cuts heal, diseases disappear when we're in equilibrium, when we're in balance. And connection. So what we mean by connection is seeing that we're more than just the self, seeing we're more than just us, that sense of love, belonging, purpose. And, you know, some people, it's, you take the pandemic, for example, what you found in the pandemic was examples of the aperture at both ends of the spectrum. So in some times you found people being more caring, more resilient, more innovative, more considerate, more full of empathy and love. Community spirit came out. And you've got people at the other end and the same people, it could be all of us doing both at the other end, being more judgmental, more fearful, more anxious, more separate. So it's almost like the, the pandemic brought out wider extremes of the aperture at both ends. As the personal mind did its thing. Now, what we're saying is all of these things exist, these capacities, these superpowers exist 
for us all in equal measures, the capacity is equal for everyone, not someone has more than others. It's just apertures whether we experience them or not. So if you think about it, all our ability to be okay, to be, and it's, it's, you know, this goes into being performing at work, to have perspective, but all these things are just subject to the aperture. And we can tell that by how it feels. Now, I'm going to ask you to explore this in a moment, but is it making a little bit of sense so far what we mean by aperture? Are you getting it? And the superpowers, do they make a little bit of sense? Or uh, please ask questions. It's getting clear, good. And when it doesn't get clear, right, and it feels not clear, your aperture is contracted. Because your conceptual mind, we're trying to work out what's going on. And that's okay. Just notice that. This doesn't make sense. Now, Nicolette, that's the question. Everyone wants to know. <laughs> How do I go from one to another? <laughs> I'd also ask you to ask yourself, which part of you is asking that question? It's the conceptual mind wants to know. Right? The lawyer in me wants to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. We like things easy. We like instructions. We don't like to figure things out ourselves. You know, we want yeah. the, the facts. <laughs> I, I studied law at university and then gave it up. Um... <laughs> don't blame you. You know, what are the five steps to get? Now, in that question, that question is so, it's so crucial that we understand that question because it would look like there's something available here in the expanded aperture that would be much better than the contracted aperture. <laughs> and for life, work, society, the globe, the planet, wouldn't it be better if we were all in a more expanded aperture using our superpowers more? So how do we get more? And there's kind of good news and bad news. Okay. The good news is there's nothing you have to do. The bad news is there's nothing you can do. But there is something you can start to realize and calibrate towards. Right. So I'll say that again. Remember, if we would go back to the chart at the beginning where we had the two sides of the uh, Venn diagram, the two sides of the circle with the conceptual mind and the um, impersonal mind. If, if there was something to do to get from contracted aperture to expanded aperture, that would be a conceptual framework, a psychological do. Now, what you'll find is if we take a lesson from the two year old, the two year old doesn't do anything and still seems to spend quite a lot of time in an expanded aperture and then he sometimes in a contracted. But the two year old is closer to something than we are it's closer to seeing that conceptual mind as real and never true. It hasn't been conditioned out of it. Now, when we start to notice that in ourselves, that starts to recalibrate for us, even as adults, and the conceptual mind seems to take less dominance. And it's about to start with the only do there is, and it isn't really a do, is a noticing and a knowing, so there's noticing and knowing. And the knowing, I'm gonna summarize this in a moment for you, the knowing is knowing the nature of the mind and knowing that we might be in a world that looks real and true, but actually it isn't, right? So the do in this, the how to, is to start to see it and what you'll find surprising about that is when you start to see it, see it. What I mean by that is realize it. It starts to do it by itself. So if to start with, we can start to get a sense of these aperture signposts. What they are is like um, warning systems in the car. Right? You know, a little light comes on in the car when it's hot or cold or over revved or something wrong or in the road you have those rumble strips you know when you're going out of your lane it goes boom 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 or some cars now beep at you if you're about to reverse into something they're telling you something that's what sensations and feelings are doing they're telling us something 
they're not telling us anything about the world. That's what we think. We think, we think that if I feel tense, urgent, self-conscious, withdrawn, that's because there's a thing making me do that. No, that feeling state, that sensation is super helpful. It's telling you your aperture's off. So I'll, I'll come back to that slide. slide. I'll just show you this slide, right? I'll come back. So sensations are like a thermometer. Do you know what I mean by thermometer? Like a gauge, like a barometer, like a feedback mechanism. Not telling you about the world, your internal or external world. They're telling you about the aperture. They're telling you how much you're seeing the world as real and true. So anxiety, stress, very helpful. Overwhelm, helpful. Depression, helpful. Now, that, I know that sounds a bit disrespectful to people that suffer from those things. How do you mean helpful? Helpful, it's telling us the aperture is contracted. It's telling us we're seeing the world as real and true. It's telling us to back off psychologically. It's telling us to wait for the inbuilt design for success to kick back in. All we have to do is take our psychology less seriously. Now, when you do that, you're, to start with, your layering mind will protest going, no, I need to do that. You know, it will kick off, <laughs> justifying itself. But explore for yourself, right? So this is always about exploring for yourself. See how it's already happening for you. How it's actually happening already. So. The sensations or the space we're in give us feedback on where we're at. That tells us to what, how we're seeing the world. Are we thinking it's coming from out there and I'm a victim to it? Does it think it's like me and my internal world creating it? Or when the aperture is expanded, you know it's just flowing through. So there is some noticing to do. And when you start noticing, it starts to ease. So, you know that dream I talked about in the morning, sometimes you wake up and you're still in your dream. And when you're still in your dream, just for five seconds, do you do anything for it to go away? No, just pops dissolves. Why? The system notices because you're calibrated to do that. What we're not calibrated to do is to see that our waking reality is real and never true. So let me just go back and then I'll come to this again. So I wanted just to share if, if, if the sensational indicators don't make any sense for you, right? That is the place to look. There often are some behaviors Is it noticing and allowing? Uh, yes, I will come to that great point. So behaviorally, just to, if you want to make this a bit more prescriptive, and um, I wouldn't, but if you want to, you can. Um, here's some things that might give you another clue if you can't spot it in the feeling yet, in the sensation, in the space, that behaviorally you're in a contracted aperture. These are just some of the common illustrative ones that you might spot in, in organizations or businesses. So you're trying to get your point across. You, you, you want to be recognized and validated and heard. Um, you want to be right. Um, you kind of put your point across again. Um, you get distracted. You're quite preoccupied. You're judgmental. You don't listen very deeply. You're quite attached to a certain thing happening, like an outcome, and you think it would be better if that outcome happened. You stopped really wanting to know what's going on. Be curious. On the other side, you'll notice that when you're in a higher aperture, you know, it's more succinct, the obviousness, you listen more deeply. It's quite effortless to pay attention. It's not tiring to pay attention. You just get captivated by something. There's not a lot of you in it. There's not a lot of me needing validation. The mind's quite neutral. You're not, you may have the odd preference, but you're not attached. And you know, that something can come from nowhere, emergence. You know that 
even if things are making no sense right now, you're just like, oh yeah, well, it will emerge. I'll know when I know, kind of thing. Quite different to the left. So can you see, can you notice in yourselves those signposts? Some people are quite good at noticing them at the extremes. So they can notice when they're really in a low aperture, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very angry, you know, and they probably won't write emails or keep them in draft or they'll go for a walk or they you know, right? And they might notice when they're really good aperture because it's like, you know, rare. But what we want to start noticing is the middle space. Because that's what's been normalized. But there's a lot of richness in that. And when you start tuning in, you really start to tell, oh, yeah. So, <clears throat> and as you're reading through this, you might start to think, well, surely sometimes it's good to have urgency or it's good to be attached to an outcome. It might be, we're not being prescriptive here, but we're talking about the feeling that state comes from. Take urgency, take urgency. So is it useful sometimes to act in an urgent manner? Absolutely. If you're crossing the road and there's a car coming, it would be important to urgently step back. But that will come like that. That will come in a very different sensation to, I must get this done, right? That, that's a very different feeling. It might be urgent, your behavior might end up being urgent, right? But nine times out of 10, urgency is a feeling we create around something that's not immediate. Real urgency or true urgency sorts itself out. If someone throws something at you, you duck. There's no feeling of urgency in it. <laughs> you just, oh yeah. I mean, it happened very fast. But urgency, that's why urgency is a low, low aperture, generally. The same with urges. You might go, yeah, I'm urging to eat. I need to eat to live. Yeah, well, that, that won't come as an urge. That will just, it won't come as a strong urge. That will just build up slowly your need to eat. Whereas I want that chocolate cake. I want that cigarette. I want that drink. I want that new pair of some things that comes as a more of an urge. So it's about really tuning into it. Now I'm just going to go to the point about allowing. So actually in our fuller version, I've got a great slide I could show you on this, but I haven't got it here. Um, this is about neutrally noticing, not trying to judge it or fix it. Because let's say you're in a contracted aperture. What would our tendency be to do? To be, ah, oh, notice my contracted aperture. Now I want to be in a higher one. <laughs> I've noticed it, yay. Now get me out of here. Get me into the higher one. Now what happens when the conceptual mind does that, it attaches itself to trying to get out of it. Now, if you just allow it, it dissolves. So here's a question for you. Before you have a thought and after you have a thought, where does it come from and where does it go to? So just take a thought, it could be a thought about, oh, I'm gonna drink my tea. Before I had that thought, and after I had it, where's it come from? Where's it go to? Where do thoughts live when they're not in our cognitive minds? <laughs> don't know, might be a good answer. I don't, I... <laughs> They don't, they don't exist, then they exist, then they don't. And thoughts will do that, they'll dissolve unless you attach to them. Right? So if I self identify with a thought and fight with it, or whatever it, or even allow it, I'm identifying with it. If you don't do that, they just come and go. That's what they do. That's their job. They come from consciousness 
into form, they dissolve back into, into consciousness. All thought, every single thought, no thought doesn't do that. And but we attach ourselves to it, it sticks around. That's why we have to write stuff down, like phone numbers, because they, they don't stay, they're not permanent things, thoughts. And it's in similarity, uh, Nicolette, to law of attraction. Similarity there, right? So that tends to be more about manifestation, but, but what we're pointing to here is that trying to fix your aperture through thought is not so helpful. Now, can you just spend a moment in an expanded aperture, right? Take yourself back to a time. Think about what we, so, so just to remind you, you felt that clarity, obviousness, lightness, energizing, connectedness, openness, those things. Right? Take yourself back there. How many ordinary simple occasions can you think when that happens? Did it happen today? Just for a second, just for two seconds. Did it happen when you first woke up? Did it happen when you looked at someone? Did it happen? Did it happen at all? Do you, do, you, do you sense it? Now, nice. Just look, look for the tiny little moments because our conceptual mind is very good at glossing over it, thinking it's a big event. No, it's not a big event. It's very ordinary. It's miraculous, but ordinary. <laughs> And we, we often strive for it, seek it. We sneak away in our days to go and have some. <laughs> we go and sit in the garden, in the yard, in the, in the park, in the beach, go for a walk. Right. And I'm assuming for most of you, it would feel a little bit similar to flow we did earlier. Would that be fair? Be, you know, we did flow. Okay, when doesn't it happen for you? Give us examples of when you think you're being more contracted. Any examples of when it when you don't, don't have it at work? <laughs> yeah, poor work. It gets a bad rep. <laughs> In traffic. Hmm. So the feeling state of work would be different to the feeling state of you doing your hobbies or cuddling your cats or dogs or whatever. It'd be a different feeling state, right? And some of us would go, well, that's bound to be the case. We'd assume that's normal. That work shouldn't feel the same as Sunday afternoon or weekend afternoon. Why? Why not? Because I bet you've had moments in work where it does feel like that too. You know, where it does feel. It's to do with how much the self's involved. So I want to just now, um, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do this and we'll go back to that, right? So uh, now let's do it this way around. I'm going to recap and then I'm going to ask you to look at your um, things you wrote earlier, right? So first of all, just to recap a little bit, right? Just to check back in. Real and never true, right? Real and never true. We exist in a moment to moment perceptual reality, like a virtual headset that appears real, but it's never true. And there's no objective truth, nothing outside the mind as to what we see, what we would call out there or in here, in here, when I'm pointing here, I'm pointing to this thing we call them, what we think is the mind. 
There's no objective truth in that. That's real. It's moment to moment created and it can appear true, but it never is. Our aperture determines what we create in the world, what we see in the world. So, you know, an example might be, let's say you're a little stressed. You then walk into a room or onto a bus or a train or into traffic. Everyone else looks a little bit stressed. Right? Oh, that's funny. You feel relaxed, beautifully relaxed. You see that. So it determines the world we see. When you're full of anger and the world's a bad place, that's what you see. And not only does our aperture determine what we see, but it also determines our resourcefulness to deal with the world. And the mind's very good at justifying. Right? It's another thing the mind is very good at doing. So I'll take that one. When I do not have enough sleep. So it would look like when I'm in, don't have enough sleep, I'm in a low aperture. Start to spot the exceptions to that. I guarantee that you'll see it, the exceptions where there's sometimes you haven't had much sleep and you, your aperture is very high. You might feel a little exhausted, but your aperture is high. But it's your thinking about the lack of sleep. That's what wears the self out. But we would, that was, that's a great one where we'd have a, um, a lid or a layer going, well, it's to sleep. So real but never true, and then noticing the aperture to our superpowers. So at any moment we're in this aperture, right? Notice that through the sensation or the space you're in. Space is just a sense of pre-thought, what, what, you know what you're in. Don't use your thoughts to tell you where your aperture is because that's your mind making it up. Sensations are helpful indicators as to where your aperture is telling you nothing about your world. So we all have that, we all have it, right? It's impossible not to have it. We all have the capacity for it. Doesn't mean we're always in it. That's why you'll see people who struggle in the world, of course, but the capacity is there. Now, there's a relationship between these two because you could think the point in the, on the left is a little cerebral or philosophical or scientific. But there's a real connection between the two, because when you see the one on the left, you get the one on the right. <laughs> and when you see the one on the right, you get the one on the left. So what we mean by that is what stops the aperture opening or keeps the aperture contracted, should we say, is thinking the world is real and true. Because it keeps the self fueled with its own narrative. The reason we don't get, most of us don't get really dwelled and plagued on by movies and stories we read. You go to the cinema, you have a really vivid experience, it's like the best film ever. It, for most people, it doesn't last that long afterwards. It's not like a week later, they're still scared by Jurassic Park. Why? You know it's real and never true. <laughs> Why a dream only feels in the moment is because we know it's really never true. Why two-year-olds are so temporarily in their funk? Because they know it's really never true. Now, what the self does is it in, in waking reality that's not a movie, a book, a theme park, a dream, is it thinks, uh oh, that's real and true. It needs fixing and I better fix it. I self, I ego better fix it. If not, I'm going to be in trouble. Forgetting it is I, forgetting it is impersonal mind. So the reason we talk about real and never true, as well as noticing the aperture, is because to get this transformatively happening for you guys, for, for people, is they have to undo all the conditioning that we've had for 300 years, or well, more than that, 3000 years. But science has done a really unhelpful job backing us into the corner thinking, the world's out there right so we have to unpin that conditioning and as that conditioning dissolves you spot the aperture more you get more into flow so there's some realizations about the aperture that are needed about the real and never trueness
and some gentle noticing. So if you want to say it in a really simple way, realities are perceptual creations in the moment. We're only ever living in a real but never true reality. There's no direct or causal power outside of mind. And feelings, sensations are just information. They don't need fixing, they don't need solving. They're just telling you about the contraction and expansion. Now, go back to that thing that you looked at right at the beginning of the, the afternoon, evening. Have a little look at it. And look at it fresh now from what we've seen about the mind. See whether you can reflect on it for a moment. Do you notice anything about the lids layering separate realities, not recognizing your superpowers? Just have a look at it for a minute and then maybe tell us in the chat or on, on the video what you spotted. And then we'll get, get to questions. So just have a little think about that thing. Maybe it just feels different. Maybe it doesn't feel as big. Maybe it's shrunk. Maybe you spotted, oh yeah, I've got some lids about that. I've got some layering. Feels more expansive. Nice. Maybe you see possibility now. Who else is seeing something about it? Mm. That's great, Nicolette. Yeah. Entanglement has vanished. Now, you know what's fascinating, isn't it? You know, when we did the little flow exercise and we did the aperture exercise just a minute ago, we didn't do anything special to, for, for them to happen. That was very ordinary. It was just letting the mind go. Right? The aperture expands and the thing looks different. The world looks different when the aperture is wider. No one's changed the world <laughs> while you weren't looking. There's no world to change, of course, we've said that. But it's just how the mind goes. Now, is there anyone who's who can't see in the thing they wrote that they wanted fresh thinking on, fresh perspective on, that they're like, well, I don't see any difference. I, I don't get the relevance of this to that. Because we could we could we can have a look, quick look at that. So if anyone got a, a thing where they're like, I don't see how my mind's involved in this. This is a something outside of what you've been talking about. Has anyone got any of those from what they wrote down? Might be a nice example. There'll be no judgment in it. We'll just talk it through. But it'd be interesting if, you, if, if there's something you can't see. Can you put up your superpower slide again? Uh, there. So has anyone got anything that they wrote earlier that, that they can't see the relevance of what we talked about to? Because now, now we can get real, you know, bring it on. This is not theory. Very happy to talk it through. So I'm going to make an assumption then that either everyone can see something about this or they're not listening at all, or they don't want to bring their thing to the thing. All of those are fine, of course, right? This is just a, <laughs> a workshop, <laughs> but it is a great opportunity. If you have, can't see the relevance, now's the time. Now's the time to go, okay, let's put the theory into practice. Um, I have another thought not related to, to your question. Go for it. <laughs> so just like imagining what could this mean like to the world if everybody's operating from this, you know, um, 
the just open lens, uh, this, you know, open aperture. I mean, if everybody's in flow, what would the world really look like today? It would be way better. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, like, it, it, lovely thought. I, slow mo movie, slow motion movie. I I don't know, fast slow motion. I don't know. Like I'm getting visuals. It's not like I'm thinking of it, but it's just I'm just seeing things expansively. I don't know how. I can't explain it actually. Mm. But it's a lovely thought though, because I think you'd find a lot of the well. You look at the moment. There's quite a lot of um, protests going on. You know, whether it's in America or in the UK or anywhere in the world. And that's because people are invisibly in a contracted aperture trying to get their way. And they're going at it like this. They're in separate realities going, we're right, you're wrong. This is unfair. This is fair. You're right. I'm wrong. Boom, boom, boom. And if you have a more contracted, uh, expansive aperture, it doesn't mean you don't do stuff about things. It doesn't mean you just give up and go, oh, it doesn't matter. There's an unfair world. But you come at it with a very different collaborative, neutral mindset, which takes it away from protest and activism to more being the change you want to see. Right. And actually, you can see that in organizations. Jonathan just put it, it's a microcosm, you know, an organization two teams are, or two people. Now, when, when their minds dissolve, something fresh comes, that emergent dialogue we talked about earlier arises, and you can solve the world problems because there isn't greedy person A and greedy person B trying to fix it. You see above the self. And we all have that within us. And But also, j just to be clear, it isn't like a utopian world where you're always in a high aperture. It's, but it's when you're in a lower aperture, it doesn't really bother you as much. So I am now personally much more happy to be grumpy than I ever used to be. <laughs> I didn't used to like being grumpy because I was an NLP. -er. I was all about being positive, 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 must be positive. And therefore, when I wasn't positive, I felt bad, especially because of my job. And now I'm like, no, 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 bring the grump on. But it doesn't last as long. And I kind of half enjoy it. I'm more like my kids. We all have a grump together <laughs> and then it pops. Nicolette, do you have a question in your hand? Yeah, hand up. Yeah. Um, it's not really a question. It's more a comment. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has read the book Sapiens by Harari, Yuval Harari. In that book, he speaks about rules being created by human beings. Rules do not exist outside of human beings. And what we've done this afternoon has really made me think about that. Because if we live with the exposed aperture, it's a fantastic idea, but it's almost as if the, the rules that we like to create for ourselves will fall by the wayside and, and the collective, and I'm sorry, I'm not maybe you know saying it in the right way, but the collective human mind would not be able to deal with the expanded aperture yeah. you know because it created rules for the world to be able to function properly you know things like red traffic lights and you know oh. you stop at a red traffic light and you know uh so you know it's interesting to think about this in while having that in the in the in my you know in my mind and in the in my thoughts as well I think it's a very good point. And that's why, for me, it's about that, you know, at the beginning, we showed the flow slide of the conceptual mind and the impersonal mind, right? Because we do need to, to live in a society with 7 billion people and on tiny little bits of land. <laughs> it is useful to have some structure, some boundaries, some laws, some whatevers, right? Now, and that's, that, that helps us survive, actually, and thrive if we all get on. So it's, it's still about having some of those boundaries and concepts and categorizations. Um, and the mind will do that, but it's, it's not self-identifying with them as part of the ego, not thinking that's how it is. It's realizing what they are. 
So if you think about playing any game, let's play a game of tennis, you know, right? If there were no lines and no net, it would be a boring game. You could just hit it anywhere. I mean, it'd be fun for about a minute or two, right? You're like, whoa, everywhere. So it is useful to have the net and um, the lines, but we know it's a game. Well, apart from people who don't, and then they get really upset, right? But when we're playing lightly, it's, it makes a lot of sense to have the rules. So it's having the rules in flow, knowing what they're made of. Does, does that answer it a little bit? Yes, if I may add, uh, Pierre, uh, for me also, I have experience being in all the time in the flow. And um, I felt that there is, I mean, I was a little bit um, in, a, in a too much high that I couldn't be grounded. And with too much flow, I actually missed on opportunities that comes from discipline, from skills, you know? So now yeah. I'm combining both discipline and flow to keep myself grounded. And then at the same time, in a good, um, in a good energy and in a good... Uh... Well, I think that's a good point. Now, what I would say is just spot whether you are trying to manually dance between the two. I need discipline, I need flow, I need discipline, I need flow, right? We should be conceptually trying to do it or allowing the system to dance between the two, right? So some people think, oh, well, this understanding is all very well, but it's not very proactive. I don't think I'd get things done. Now, to me, what the, the, the contracted aperture way is going, I must be disciplined, I must be proactive, I must be willpower all the time, right? Now, what we're pointing to here is that if you allow the mind to, to do what it does, you, you won't stop being proactive, but you'll be spontaneously proactive. You'll have spontaneous discipline, if that makes sense, Lovely, rather than yes. I must have discipline. So you're letting yep. the system dance rather than you control the dance. So the, you mean the internal system? Yeah, I, I mean the impersonal mind. It yeah, provides spontaneity, and then you will be because when when you're when you're proactive from a spontaneous perspective, it comes with loads of inspiration, performance, creativity, power. When you tell yourself to be on the right hand side, it doesn't really work. Yeah, and I think there is more maturity in taking decisions also, like um, when yeah. there is a combination of both. So it's about it's not. The conceptual mind is incredibly useful. We wouldn't really operate as a society very well without it. Sapiens points to that. But we've over-egged it. We've over massively over-indexed on it. Um, Whale, is, is your hand up? I don't know if that's really you or the people that are called you. But... Oh, you've gone. Uh, well, did you have a question? No. Do you have a question? No. Uh, Nicolette, sorry, did you, you come up to your point? Yes. Yeah, no, it does, it does make complete sense. Thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, so I'm just, I'm interested to know whether anyone still wants to air their thing that we asked them, uh, this thing, um, not this thing, or was it before that? Um, this thing that someone who's stuck and just can't see the relevance. Just while I was thinking about doing that, I want to just in, in the chat, um, my guess she's got some great points. Money is a massive concept in action. Yeah, this transfer of value through this thing and money gives me status and oh, complete, uh, it's a complete conceptual mind thing. <laughs> But sorry, Pierre, I think also money comes, I mean, the, uh, I would say the abundance flows more in the, um, in the flow. Well, I think when you focus less on money, you seem to get more of it, right? I mean, that doesn't mean yeah. you turn your back from it. If you turn your back from it, then yes, you're like, no, I don't like money. Money is for evil people. No, I don't mean that. I just mean when you're neutral about it, because it's a currency that we use, you can be proactive towards it. But if you... If you have lots of thinking about it, it gets in the way, right? Okay. 
Now, there are ways to make a load of money from a low aperture. Yeah, there's probably a book about it somewhere. And most people do it. But it doesn't come with, <laughs> my sense is, it comes with hard work, like psychological hard work. Um, money always comes with hard work, really. Um, toil doesn't really come with happiness. It comes with, you know, it, it, it comes at a cost, put it that way. Cost of other Okay, things. interesting. So, um, what other questions do we have? I'm just going to sort of pull this towards the end so you can hopefully see what we're pointing to here. Let me just go back to the da -da -da -da, spin through this. So, I don't think anyone else wants to play on this. Never mind. So if we think about being future fit right now, okay, this is called future fit. You think, oh, what's this got to do with being future fit? Is this got anything to do with it? Well, yeah, I believe it has. Because if you start to see what we're talking about here and you think about what the future needs, well, from society and from us, would it be helpful to be in flow more all the time to get the very best of your conceptual mind and to access the dance with the impersonal mind? Yes, that'd be helpful. Would it be useful in the future to be able to get to new perspectives quicker? To be agile and inventive? Yes. <laughs> Would it be useful to find some sense of purpose, connection, even though that change is what it's to, you know, to realize there's more than just you? Yeah. Would it be, would it be useful to have a sense of okayness, contentment, mental well-being, regardless to what's going on in this ever-changing thing we play in, we call the world? So really being future fit, if you get all of that right, everything else sort of takes care of itself. This is the foundation. This is the fertile soil. This is the firmware upgrade we're talking about. Because a lot of people are doing a lot of things to try and get those four things, five things, and it's there already. It's just hidden behind, it's hidden in the aperture behind the conceptual mind. So, Put that into context, right? If you're in an organization, a team, a business that wants to get more from less, yeah, we all want that because of costs cutting and but we still want more out. If you want more clarity and decisiveness because you have to be more nimble, more agile, yes, this will help. If you want less stress and overwhelm because life's just quite hard work, if you have to deal with things changing all the time, if you have a complex culture, dysfunctional culture, if you feel a lot of pressure to always be achieving and think pressure is what you need, pressure comes from low aperture. You don't need it. If you want to be a leader, but want to be able to do it without having to keep thinking everything through and do it from obviousness and connection. If you want to just have better well-being and resilience, more fresh perspectives, want more connection with what you do and other people then quality of mind is going to help. And what's lovely, it doesn't matter who you are, right? It doesn't matter. Actually, IQ, EQ, age, gender, ethnicity, culture, education, expertise, irrelevant. More than irrelevant, actually. I've got some uh, sort of associates, people I know who do this similar kind of thing to this. They, they package it slightly differently in prisons, right? They go and talk to people in prisons. They're testing this out in prisons, this understanding, not in the same wrapper of quality of mind, but it's sort of same as what behind it. And it's funny because they often say it's easier to work with people in prison than it is in business. Now, why would that be? Why? Because people who are doing okay and quite intelligent are self-identified with their own self. <laughs> they're more attached to their own reality. They're more attached to their own ego. Whereas in prison, you're willing to open to listen to things. I'm generalizing, of course, but the, the thing that makes a difference here is your openness to explore it. If you're open to explore this, both conceptually and at a felt level, people will find benefit. It's amazing. So it doesn't matter how smart you are. You don't need to be smart. There's lots of doors to this right, that you'll come through. This is just one door. Um, but when you start to see it and join the dots, it changes everything. So this is the hidden variable we're talking about, right? 
this is the hidden variable that once people start to see, makes a difference to everything. Now, we've got a bit of time, 10 minutes. I'd love to hear your questions. I know I didn't, I cut down a few of the questions earlier because of time, but I'd love just to get the realness for you on this. So please ask away. There's lots of th questions you can ask, Any, anything goes. So open up to you to ask any question, even if you think you don't know why you're asking it. So how do you think uh, we can sustain uh, the practice uh, in our daily lives? Uh, this is you know, very inspiring, but uh, how does one uh, you know, keep at it uh, uh, through everything that one has to go through? Yes, and I think my short answer to that is by noticing. If I had to say one word, it's noticing and knowing what is going on. So what I mean by that is if you notice more of the time than we do at the moment, our aperture, and by, by that I mean sort of where we are sensationally, right? If we notice that that is always telling us where we're at, so it's this. And then know where that is coming from. So we notice, oh yeah, okay, this is where my aperture is. And no, it's not the outside world. No, it's not your past. No, it's not your personality. No, it's not whatever it is. It's just consciousness, it's source, it's mind. And then get curious about that. That's all you need to do to bring it into more day-to-day happening right that will start to recalibrate the system there is some conceptual exploring that people you know when we do quality of mind programs helps definitely but the noticing starts to reawaken the system to calibrate that doesn't sound like much but there's a lot of power in it you mentioned the, and, the mind as well Sorry, can, Magesh, do you want to just answer that just before I go to you, Basil? So, Magesh, do you want to just... I just yeah, uh, no, thank you. That's brilliant. Uh, just wanted to um, kind of uh, ask you, uh, is there a reason why you never use the word self-awareness throughout your pitch? Uh, is there a particular reason or uh, is just that uh, you, you, uh, you, you don't need it? Well... I'm trying sometimes to nuance, if you know what I mean, point the difference between this and some other mindfulness and meditation, because they seem to be practices that people do to try and get the self to calm down, right? Now, we're pointing to something actually fundamentally more powerful than that, that sees, it, sees us see the self as real and never true. So it's... We're trying to get away from self-awareness, really, because self-awareness for a lot of people is, um, if I've got that chart, uh, he sits in, do I have it? it? It sits in this middle ground here, right? Our internal world. Some go, I'm very self-aware. And what they mean by that is I'm aware of my conditioning, my beliefs, my values, my goals. We don't want people to be aware of that because that's all conditioned. So it's not self-awareness. It's actually trying to see the nature of self. So it is a bit of a nuanced difference that probably in the three hour version of this, we don't get into, but if you do more quality of mind, we get really stuck into, in a helpful way, what we call the difference between self and I. Oh, brilliant. I, I got it. I got it. Thank you so right. much. Cool. <laughs> Basil, sorry, I cut you off there. Do you have a question? No, uh, you mentioned that, uh, like, uh, just commenting on uh, uh, Magish, uh, that um, uh, if to, to sustain this, you, you mentioned earlier uh, during the uh, call that um, we we can ask out the mind itself, right, about where I am, where am I? Well, the way the way we can find out is that noticing, right? Noticing. Mm. So. What you don't want to do is ask your conceptual mind, where am I now? Yeah. That will give you a thought, a conceptual thought back. 
and instead start to notice using the very lightest awareness of sensation. And just because okay. I, I never used to know, I couldn't really, I wasn't very calibrated, if you know the word, what I mean by calibrated, I couldn't really tell the difference between, I could tell when I was really upset and really kind of in a good space, but I couldn't tell anything in the middle. And now it's much more obvious to me where I'm at. And just that neutral noticing and knowing what it isn't, right? Knowing it isn't the outside world, knowing it isn't my personality, knowing it isn't my past, knowing it isn't an event, mm. just knowing that's what happens, right? That's, that's the noticing. What we will do after this is, if you're interested, send you some more things to look at, right? Yes, please, yes. We've got podcasts, we've got all sorts of things. If you're a little bit curious, that you can start to explore. And the self-explore, you know, that I said, the self-learn that I mentioned at the beginning, if you stay curious to this, is where it happens. Awesome, thanks. Nicolette, is your hand up from last time or is it up again? No, it's from last time. Okay. <laughs> That's probably where... Oh, sorry. Let me lower my hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I didn't know it was an old hand or a new hand. Old one. While you've got a hand, but I think that's an old hand. Yeah, it's been there for a long time. Yeah, uh, yes, do you um, have a question or is it an old hand? Excuse me? Do you have a question? Yeah, 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 I have. Uh, what you just mentioned uh, oh. so far is amazing. Uh, now my question is the distraction of the brain or mind. How we can avoid this? Right. So at any time, ask yourself, when is a thought coming through, right? Let's say it's a, we might call it a distraction. We might not even know it's a distraction. That will come in, right, into your mind and there'll be a little feeling it a little sensation in that so let's say you're doing some work and a thought comes in oh i want to check my facebook or i want to check my instagram or i want to go and watch television right that comes in or i want something to eat right that comes in you just notice that and you'll start to notice that it comes in an aperture in a space in a sensation and what what the feeling the sensation is telling us is whether to buy into that or not right it's telling us whether that's a legitimate thing that we need to address whether there's obviousness to it or whether it's just our noisy mind doing that because that's what our mind does right so we've got a lot of habits where our mind tries to distract us right so it yeah. will you know distraction is preoccupation and distraction we have a noisy mind now, if we don't give that anything, it dissolves. It just goes back into the nothing it came from. If we attend to it, it lives again. You're right. So the first step is to be aware, is awareness. Yeah, it's the neutral you notice. You notice, you notice there is a distraction. Just stop, stop what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not doing anything else to it. It's just noticing it, right? Um, if I very quickly can find that slide and that other yeah, yeah if there's something and uh, is there an, uh, any way like to minimize these distractions maybe uh, some useful tips you know can you you cannot do sometimes this is what I'm telling myself I cannot do multitasking all the time here and there and eating and watching and do many things at the same time this will I lose the focus at the end well, of course, we can try and fix our outside world. So we can do common sense things like turn off distractions. Like if we've got our phone on, turn it off. If we've got the, you know, so we can do very common sense things, right? That come from our own realizations. Like, well, when I'm working, it's better to turn my phone off. That would be a realization like, oh yeah, of course. Or I'll tell someone not to call me between six and eight because I'm working. So we can, we, so the behavior that we might do to reduce, reduce distractions, comes from our wisdom, comes from our common sense when we're in a great aperture, right? So yeah. it, it, I'm not saying don't fix the outside world by all means, but, but if, if you just fix the outside world and don't notice the mind, you'll, you'll be fixing the symptom, not the, the kind of, you know. So I'm just gonna share this really quickly. This is what, what one little picture I've got on this another thing, right? Because some of you are asking about the noticing. So I'm not going to tell you how to notice. I'm going to tell you how not to notice, right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how, yeah. we generally, how we generally notice 
is we have a feeling or a sensation. We then go, what is that? Right, I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm unhappy. Then we self-identify with that. We assume that's coming from somewhere, the world, me, right? Then we question, do I need to act or fix that? And then we get annoyed when it doesn't go away. And then we justify it won't go away. Oh, I won't go away because until the outside world's changed, it won't go away, right? Until lockdown's over. And then we repeat steps one to six. That's what we do. So just spot that your mind's up to that. <laughs> and go, oh yeah, look how it's doing that. Wow. And instead, just notice it. Done. Yeah, then, you will eliminate all the rest. Then, 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 then it dissolves. Then it dissolves. Anyway, right. brilliant. Thank you. Great. Um, have you got any other questions just for the last minute or two? How, how do we bring this to more people? Uh, obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot. Uh, this, this is a universal message, right? So uh, I think it's really important, especially now for uh, people to people to have this knowledge. Well, um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I think it's just about getting it out there in a form that people can digest. And, and that's often the challenge because if you simplify it down too far, people just think they know already. If you make it too profound and complex, you lose people. I'm, I'm always going between the two. Uh, I'm probably better at the last one than the first one. Um, but <laughs> it's trying to get the middle ground of people being able to go, oh, and then just getting a little bit curious because in a way we all want to see this. It's, it's a, it's a, as you say, it's a very universal thing and we're all looking for it. We don't know we are. So it, um, there's some, there's some nowadays compared to 10 years ago, there's more books and podcasts and videos than there's ever been about this kind of stuff. So that's good news. And there's an awakeness happening, you know, there's also a fake wokeness happening, but there's a genuine awakeness happening too. So um, what I want to say at the end is, um, thank, for those of you who are engaged, it, sounded, it felt like you were really engaged. I'm sure some people weren't, in which case, sorry, probably not your cup of tea. But for those of you who were, um, wonderful, thank you. Um, we'll send you some more information about this so you can carry on being curious. Remember, that was the thing that we said at the beginning. If you carry on being curious, this gets better and better. And what we've heard in three hours can expand for you. So. We'll send you some information on email or whatever it is, podcast links, and then do reach out and ask us, say, I want to know more. Tell me, email. So there's a website, um, qualityofmind.biz. You've got consolidants details. We're going to email you. Um, is there a formal process for how we're going to do feedback or wrapping this up? I don't know. I don't know if Baron's still here, but. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we can share the recording of the session for uh, everybody um, after this. And um, thank you so much, Piers, for uh, this wonderful session. And thanks, everyone, for listening attentively and sticking on. I would say, I would say, and this might sound a little bit self-promoting, but if you listen to it again, you'll hear more. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> actually listen to it about five ten times i listen to the same stuff again and again over 10 years and keep hearing new as if like they've changed the recording but actually i realize it's me so <laughs> i would the first time you hear it you miss so much but thank you everyone thank you so much for yeah. thank you, know, you. Thank, thanks thank for you organizing Pierre. thank you so thank much thank you very much thank you thank you. thank you do you all mind if we take a quick picture if you can switch your videos on for those who haven't Yeah. So, okay, when everyone's ready. Yeah. Awesome. So, three, two, one. What do you want to say? Quality of mind. <laughs> Aperture. <laughs> Aperture. Maybe something like you am. Yeah. Okay, I've got the picture. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Pierce. Bye. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Welcome, everyone. Bye, everyone.